Dr. Vargas Kulin said, and I quote, I trust in a humble way, daring is such an instrument of change, an instrument not only of technical change, but also of economic and social change. It is to such instruments that we must look to build the India tomorrow. I unquote. From the outset, Operation Flood was conceived and implemented as much more than a dairy program. Rather, dairy was seen as an instrument of development, generating employment, and regular income for millions of rural people. And this is why he will always be remembered as a man with strong will and self belief and his persuasive efforts. Namaste. A very good afternoon to all in Sandhu. I, Dr. Smriti Smita Mahapatra, on behalf of World Schooling Center of Excellence at Irma, welcome each and every one in the house and the online participants all across India and different parts of the world to the technical session on linking daily science to society as part of the ongoing birth centenary celebrations of our founder, Dr. World Schooling, dubbed the Kulin Mahotsav. As we have assembled here in the hybrid mode, the basic objective of today's session is to discuss contemporary issues relating to dairy in India and make strategic plan to take the dairy industry to a next level. Milk and dairy products are the excellent sources of nutrients and one of the best solutions to reduce the problem of malnutrition in the country and at the same time, help in the promotion of dairy in a cooperative way will generate more revenue for the farmers more employment opportunities, and improve the human prosperity. Therefore, Operation Flood can be viewed as a 20-year experiment confirming the vision of human development. So to begin with today's session, I invite Professor Umakan Das, sir, Director, Institute of Rural Management, Alan, for the welcome address. Please, sir. A uh, very, very good afternoon, Sri Mumbai Sahaji, Chairman NDDB, Dr. Zubi Pratapati, Chairman BK Service Center, other dignitaries uh, who are present uh, in a physical mood, and uh, special uh, in, uh, welcome to uh, Carolina and Dr. Judith, uh, former President IDF and Chief Executive of Dairy UK, UK and Dr. VK Srivastava, President National Academy of uh, Dairy Science India and member ASRB New Delhi and other uh, uh, friends. So uh, on behalf of uh, Irma and on my personal behalf, I would uh, like to invite each one of you to this uh, special session, which is going to deliberate linking dairy science to society as part of uh, our 100th uh, the centenary celebration of uh, Dr. Varghese, uh, uh, who is the founder of uh, Irma. Uh, when I see the, the topic is very uh, uh, thought-provoking, as a social scientist, I see is linking the dairy and that uh, to society, which is the very sole purpose objective of why Irma was uh, set up by uh, Dr. Korean in 1979. The very uh, objective of, of uh, Irma is to work for the underserved uh, so people of the society, under uh, privileged people of uh, the country, and how we are going to uh, professionalize the institute which are serving this underserved people and underserved uh, part of the country. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, by uh, through dairy how we are, because we can see the multiplier effect of uh, the dairy sector. It's not only going to help the those who are directly or indirectly involved in the dairy sector, but it is also going to help uh, the people or households who are uh, uh, indirectly linked to the dairy sector. Well, unless uh, the dairy sector and the rural sector as a whole is uh, uh, developed, the country is not going to develop because 50 to 60 percent of uh, the GDP is coming from the rural areas directly or indirectly. 60 percent of the people are uh, uh, directly or indirectly, they are related to the rural areas. So if you want the society to be developed, if you want the economy to grow, it is the rural sector and therefore the dairy sector has to grow. Uh, uh, so I am sure this uh, uh, deliberation is going to address some of the challenges issues which uh, the dairy sector is uh, going through and how the cooperative movements and cooperative and uh, with the inception of the new ministry, this uh, particular sector is going to grow at a faster rate. I once again welcome 
each one of you. And I'm sure uh, the deliberations are going to be fruitful and uh, we are going to have uh, many takeaways from this uh, particular uh, uh, panel discussion as well as the opening remarks and other uh, dignitaries who are going to talk about uh, the dairy sector. Thank you once again and I welcome you. Thank you, sir. May I request Dr. J.V. Pajapati, sir, chairperson, Burgess Clearing Center of Excellence, Irma, to welcome the distinguished guests of the session with rose embedded khadi handkerchiefs marking the significance of Make in India textiles. Thank you, sir. Now, may I invite Dr. Pankaj Parman to welcome Dr. J.B. Pajapati, our chairperson, for the School and Center of Excellence. Thank you. The World Schooling Center of Excellence, BKCO in short, was established at the Institute of Human Management, EMA, in 2015 to keep alive Dr. Cohen's intellectual legacy. The center strives to transverse the visionary path set by Dr. Kurian and continues to share his contributions through his ongoing research, knowledge creation, and dissemination. To showcase the same, World Schooling Center of Excellence releases an information brochure on Dr. Kurian's birth anniversary every year. So may I request a distinguished guest on the dais to release the World Schooling Center of Excellence information brochure for the year 2020-21. Thank you, everyone. Now, may I invite the chair of today's session, Sri Manish Ji, Chairman, National Dairy Development Board, NDDB, for his opening remarks. Sri Sa, a bright alumnus of State MC College of Dairy Science, Anand, and Emma, has been involved in dairy policy making, management, and administration for a longer time. Please, sir. So good afternoon, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dr. J.B. Prajapati, Chairman of BKSUE, Dr. Dash, Director Irma, Carling, uh, Director General of Indian Dairy Feder International Dairy Federation, Dr. Judith Bryans, former President of uh, IDF and also the Chief Executive of Dairy UK. Dr. Srivastava, President, National Academy of Dairy Science India and Member Agriculture Scientist Recruitment Board. All distinguished panel members, Dr. Parekh, uh, Dr. Joshi, uh, Kuldeep Ji, Sri Kuldeep Chaudhary from Amul, as uh, Mr. Amit Vyas has not uh, joined today. Chairman NCDFI and MD 
NCDFI, Principal Dairy Science College, MD Vidya Dairy, and all, all invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I think, first of all, I would like to compliment Vergis Kurium Center of Excellence for organizing this technical session uh, on the theme linking dairy science to society. It's, it's very much relevant and will continue to remain so, I think, for our dairy industry. If it has to be sustainable and also resilient. The close relations of people and cattle, uh, I think, have benefited both the species for almost 10,000 years, and they still do. Those of you who have visited NDDB's Shastri boardroom, I think we still have that limestone relief carving from the necropolis of ancient uh, Egypt which is dated 1450 BC. And uh, it clearly establishes the relationship between these two species. The theme of the current technical session is not only linked to this, but is also a step forward in that direction. We all know India is now the largest milk producer in the world, and it contributes almost 23% of the global milk production. And as we all know, again, the milk production in India is, is done by masses. I think majority of our small and marginal farmers, they together account 86% of the average operational land holding and maybe less than one hectare land. And therefore, I think uh, it, it is linked to intricately to the livelihood of millions and millions of our small and marginal farmers. Dairying also is now a major source of subsidiary income for all these farmers and contributes, as uh, Dr. Das told, 12% of the rural household income and is as high as about 25% in case of landless households. Thus, I think dairying today provides a wide array of benefits and addresses a multitude of issues, both financial, social, economical and plays a very important role in providing employment uh, to farmers, especially women members, and indirect employment to uh, millions of other our country fellows. I think milk is indispensable in ensuring the nutritional security in the nation. Uh, and it is also linked to the nutritional requirement uh, in our society. Uh, Ensuring food security is a significant issue in our context, where more than 33% of the population is estimated to be poor, and 50% of the children, they are malnourished in one way or another. So a diet that contains sufficient milk and milk products provides 25 to almost 35% of the daily protein, protein requirement and it can have a positive effect on weight gain or linear growth and the cognitive development in the children, age maybe six months to five years, who are suffering from uh, maybe severe to moderate malnutrition. Indian dairying is also about uh, providing affordable milk and milk products to our consumers in general and children in particular. It is intricately linked to the society, as I told, and we now need to look for various opportunities to link our sector with the society. Dairy science, as I understand in the current context, refers to any scientific intervention in any aspect of dairying, uh, you know, say from farm to consumer, which improves upon the existing practices or open new vistas. And obviously, it can encompass as its application of science through cross-sectional subjects, including animal husbandry, agriculture, dairy technology, and many a times in an amalgamated manner. So the opportunity to link dairy science to society are embedded in the challenges to maintain, improve milk production for the benefit of our dairy farmers significantly improve the quality of milk and milk products and also add value, you know, value addition to ensure that consumers continues to be 
drawn to milk and dairy products. We have to improve the operational efficiencies, reduce impact of dairying on environment, and to ensure a competitive price uh, for the consumers. I think in this context, a fundamental need is to ensure that success is in laboratories. They are replicable in the field also. The availability of high-yielding, healthy, disease-free cattle suitable for our local condition can be ensured by linking developments in science in the field of animal nutrition, breeding, animal health, ration balancing, availability of good quality semen. Now uh, we have the sex sorted semen to embryo transfer technology, which is now gaining momentum. Use of ethmo veterinary practices for the animal health management, which will significantly reduce the usage of antibiotics and elimination of diseases such as FMD and animal identification are the areas I think that need to be augmented for the benefit of the society. If we see currently about 70% of the genetic potential of our bovine, bovines is exploited and it should be increased through the scientific breeding, health and feeding mechanism. Large scale scientific interventions such as increase in AI coverage, extensive use of sex sorted semen, producing high quality genetic married bulls, import of some bovine germplasm, application of genomics and upgrading low yielding non descript bovine, it needs to be taken up on a large scale. And these initiatives should be backed by scientific animal feeding, as I told. So specialized feed during different phases of milk production cycle, such as pregnancy feed, early lactation feed, or fertility feed, I think they should be all promoted. And ration advisories and incorporation of green folder and or silage appropriately need to be focused upon. We are all aware of the mitten need to improve the quality of milk and our dairy products also. So focus should be on improvement in the quality of raw milk, mainly through reduction of bacteriological quality and control of contaminants. Further propagating clean milk production programs, which we have already began long back, and good hygienic practices at the entry level of the dairy value chain needs to be taken up. We have seen the technological interventions in terms of uh, bulk milk coolers or AMCUs and uh, DPMCUs along with now AI-enabled milk procurement systems, uh, which will monitor quality of raw milk right from the animal to the dairy. And they need to be implemented again on a large scale in all the areas. Appropriately designed maybe uh, reward and penalty-based pricing system. I think it is also now need of the hour. It can be considered to augment the science and technology-based uh, quality incentive. One more thing uh, which I would like to highlight about the product development. So creation of various variants and development of products that reduce the kitchen time, because we have seen during the Corona time. So ready to use sweets or thawing or heating, and then eat the products. Uh, dry mixes, uh, various types of dry mixes like we have seen for gulab jamun, that can be reconstituted for immediate use. Some semi-cooked products uh, you know, requiring minimum processing time at the home. So these are, uh, I think, some of the products which will have to see, uh, to see that we have newer product developed. If consumer can be presented with food that is ready to use or ready for use with minimum preparation at home, I think it will form a staple component of the diet entirely new segment of market and then can become available to us. The another area is the composite foods uh, like, uh, you know, it's still untapped and inadequately tapped area in the context of new product development uh, for retaining the consumers. And these foods are those that incorporate ingredients from one or more source. So you have dairy, plus non-dairy components. And I think they are more uh, satiating and nutritious along with a great potential to replace 
or supplement these staple food com components in our diet. Such foods have a regular consumption possibility and to be successful, they should be formulated with more and more natural ingredients as far as possible. It should contain least additives and consistently possess sensory attributes uh, that are liked by the consumers along with a reasonably good shelf life. I think that is the area where again uh, our scientists are working. Consumer education on variations in the quality or the sensory attributes that is color, flavor and natural fruit pulp may vary affecting final product attributes and so arise the We'll have to see that more and more uh, natural ingredients are used, therefore, and which will be an important dimension in the acceptability of such products by the consumers. One more area, I think Dr. Prajapati is here, who have worked on the probiotic foods. So, foods which with claims such as probiotic foods, they have been uh, gradually now emerging in our country, and they are also foods with immunity boosting which claims, uh, you know, an instant focus due to the recent pandemic uh, we have seen. So to be sustainably successful, I think the claims in respect of such foods should be based on sound scientific evidences and foods targeted for specific group of consumers, such as children or elder people or pregnant women or sports person. That also forms another category of uh, new products, I think, where our industry can focus and uh, design some products. Again, products for malnourished children, diabetes or obese people, and that also need to be formulated considering identified health conditions, uh, which require, again, scientific knowledge and our technical skills. Uh, some of the other area, I think, where the panelist will speak about the development of specialty products, like we have seen milk protein concentrates or whey protein concentrates, purified milk protein, lactose and some minerals, uh, fractioning the colostrum to isolate bioactive peptides. So these are, I think, some of the uh, products which are likely to uh, be tapped in our country and it needs to be explored for the benefit of farmers and society at large because this can provide additional revenue to the uh, farmer members. One area which I would uh, like to highlight is reducing waste and improving the operational efficiency. I think it has to be a continuous activity in all our dairy plants. So employing proven technologies and high efficiency, scientifically designed equipment to this end should be, I think, an ongoing and continuous activity. Reduction in methane gas emission, I think that is one more area by by maybe balancing the feeding of cattle, maximizing the use of solar and other renewable energy sources, and looking for alternate materials or approaches for plastic, for packaging and distribution of milk and milk products. I think these are the areas that need popularization to reduce the impact of dairy activities on our environment. So NDDB has started many such allied and useful activities uh, like generation of biogas with concomitant production of biofertilizer, use of renewable energy sources, commensurate with local condition. And these are the areas where we are focusing. And we have now realized that manure is the second uh, most valuable livestock product if we see after milk. And it, its proper storage and application need to be fully exploited not only for providing additional revenue to the farmers, but also for improving the soil fertility as an economic option for energy and biofuels. So technology to segregate solids from cow dung or buffalo dung and their utilization as biofertilizer. Now we have developed, we have developed some field tiles, developed some prototype machines, but I think a lot need to be done if we have to progress uh, in this area. Uh, lastly, I, I think I'll summarize that while the dairy science has improved the livelihood of millions of small and uh, marginal dairy farmers through various interventions in milk production with improved milk quality and also 
by various nutritious dairy products by adopting advanced technology it has also contributed significantly to the well being of consumer across the country i am sure that today's deliberations will turn out some useful approaches to augment the efforts of all the stakeholders in creating strong and useful linkage between dairy science and society thank you i think before i close i would also like to uh, just uh, before inviting the speakers i will just uh, like to introduce them our first speaker is uh, scarlin emon she is a director general of international dairy federation she was appointed director general uh, in february 2018 she is from quebec canada she is a lawyer by profession and has been a diplomat and has more than 20 years 25 years experience in senior executive and public affairs roles in private public and also non for profit sectors having worked 9 years in the canadian dairy industry and abroad she has a deep understanding of the dairy sector worldwide from various angles the producers professors research policy regulation any angle you see and experience with international organizations also such as wto fao iso and codex next speaker uh, dr judith bryans Dr. Judith is the chief executive of Dairy UK. She took over the running of the organization in 2000, October 2013, and prior to that, she was director of the Dairy Council, a position she held from 2006. She was elected president of the IDF in 2016 and served for a four-year term in that role. After completing her term as IDF president. Uh, she was made an honorary member of the idf and is also the chair of the idf task force on the food system summit judith also served on the board of the global dairy for platform at a european level she is a member of the board of the european dairy association and in uk she is a board member of the number of organizations including dairy energy savings and the milk marketing forum She has a PhD from King's College London and is a registered nutritionist. Our third and uh, last speaker will be uh, Professor and Dr. A K Srivastava, member in Animal Science and ex director and vice chancellor of NDRI Karnal. And Dr. Srivastava, a distinguished pharmacologist and toxicologist, is a member of Agriculture Scientist Recruitment Board. before joining asrb uh, dair ministry of agriculture and farmer welfare he was also director and vice chancellor at icr and dair institute uh, karnal he is also a vice president of national academy of agriculture sciences uh, president national academy of dairy science india and patron of indian dairy association he is a distinguished member of national academy of science fellow of national academy of agriculture sciences and host of other uh, such associations he has been decorated with numerous prestigious awards and honors including icr jawaharlal nehru award international no sale award and so many others i think uh, it will take long time for me to read all the awards and uh, he has more than 250 research papers in his credit and has guided more than 30 phd and mbs cms or md students so i welcome all these three speakers and uh, we can start this session now thank you so much thank you thank you so much sir may i request our guests to occupy the front row before we begin the virtual session Now I invite Ms. Caroline Edmon, Director General, International Dairy Federation, Brussels, to speak on challenges and opportunity in dairy sector. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, distinguished guests, uh, and dear colleagues. First, I'd like to thank Emma for the privilege to participate to this webinar. 
which is part of the Kyrian, uh, Dr. Kyrian anniversary celebration. A few years ago, another famous Indian man, Dr. Arath Sodhi, gave me a book entitled, I Too Are the Dream, Virgas Kurian by Guri Salvi. I have read, I've, I've read that book on my way to India to attend my first dairy industry congress hosted in Patna that year. I was inspired and touched by the vision and engagement of Dr. Kurian. It worth celebrating the life of a person that made such a significant contribution to the life of millions and often the poorest. I was also impressed by the humanity of the man who was able to notice that not all the workers of his plant could afford the milk they were producing. And then he gave them access to that milk. He was a true pioneer and he still contributed to the advancement of the dairy sector to the Virgus Curian Center of Excellence, which we are uh, celebrating today. You will not be surprised to learn that he also contributed to IDF. I find this great photo in our archive of Dr. Kurian oops, at the uh, IDF World Dairy Summit in Delhi in 1974. So as you could see, he was also part of IDF community. The title of the event today is Liking Dairy Science to Society. What could say that dairy science purpose is to serve society? By providing research and knowledge for the development of good farming and processing practices, dairy science ensures quality dairy foods and efficient resource utilization. By providing facts and evidence to regulators so they can make science-based standard and policy, dairy science ensures safe, nutritious and sustainable food and protect consumers from being misled. All dairy scientists experts that are then participating to nourishing the world, facilitating the production and trade of dairy food. The International Dairy Federation is an example of the contribution of dairy science to society. From its foundation in 1903, one of IDF key mandate has been to contribute to hygienic products. Milk quality and safety has always been at the art of IDF work. The development of science-based regulation and policies is crucial to ensure food security. We also know that there is no food security without food safety. So ensuring the development of adequate standard by Codex Alimentarius is the first step. IDF has been Codex advisor since the creation of Codex in 1962. Ensuring that codex standards are integrated to the national regulation by countries is the next step to ensure an harmonized level of food safety around the world. Obviously, implementation, testing, and sampling are key to maximize the impact of the standard. IDF brings together more than 1,200 dairy experts from around the world to produce technical publication and exchange knowledge as well as to share our expertise with international governmental organizations such as Kodak and OIE. As you know, science is not easy to communicate to non-expert. So we must then ensure to translate that science into messages that regulator and policymaker can understand and use in their work. We must also benefit from all opportunities to communicate the goodness of dairy and its contribution to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, healthy diet and sustainable food system. IDF School Milk Knowledge Hub that we've launched in April is a way to share knowledge with, sake, with share of stakeholders on the benefit of milk and dairy food in school feeding programs. The IDF Dairy Sustainability Outlook is also another way of sharing good practices from our members and stakeholders. In addition to support the substantial role of women in dairy farming, IDF is also promoting dairy science to women and girls. Attracting young women and girls to dairy science is crucial for our sector. One of our key objective is to share information on the benefit of dairy to people and the planet. As the former UN Secretary General of the United Nations, Ben Ki-moon said, at the IDF World Dairy Summit in Daijan in 2018, 
the dairy sector plays a leading role in international efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals, which are aimed at socioeconomic transformation to eradicate poverty and hunger and to construct a sustainable world where humanity can, can enjoy better education, healthcare, and equality. So it sums up to milk is perfect. The dairy sector has a very powerful story to tell on its contribution to the UN SDGs. So more than ever, we need to promote and explain the positive contribution of dairy to the sustainable diet, to development in general, and to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It will not be possible to achieve the goals, particularly the one on zero hunger, reduction of poverty, improvement of health and wellness without the nutritious value of milk and dairy food. As part of this global story, we need to notice that it's evaluated in 1 billion people are actually working directly in the dairy sector and 6 billion people are consumer or impacted by dairy around the world. This is very substantial. 20% of the world agricultural land are cared for by the dairy sector. And the global level of milk contribution, an average of 5% of energy, 10% of protein, and 9% of fat. Milk is one of the most produced and valuable agricultural commodities worldwide. It ranked third by production by tonnage. Uh, it is the top agricultural commodity in value term in the world. Uh, it contributes to 27% of the global value added from livestock. 10% from global value add, added from agriculture. And milk and dairy uh, account for about 14% of global agricultural trade. So this is significant impact and a positive story that we can tell. It's also important to note that 37 million farms are actually female ed. And with 80 million women engaged in dairy farming, it is key to the development, uh, uh, sustainable development goal and, and empowerment of women around the world. In 2016, IDF and FAO signed what we call the Dairy Declaration of Rotterdam, with an objective to recognize the importance of dairy to development uh, and to the, US, uh, to the UN development goals. You will notice that our colleagues from India have actually ratified that declaration in 2019 when we were in Istanbul at the summit. So that declaration is an opportunity for us to tell our story and our commitment and engagement with the sector. So I was, I, I was asked to talk to you a bit more about the challenge and opportunity for the sector. So I'm gonna start with just an outlook. Uh, so a couple of principles of what we've seen uh, in the last year. So as you know, we're still in, uh, in hopefully the end of a pandemic, uh, but it's important to notice that throughout that pandemic, uh, the dairy sector has demonstrated a strong resilience and its capacity to adapt to change of consumer patterns. Milk production has increased in most of the country around the world, except from EU and South Africa, and growth is expected to continue. Substantial and still ongoing increase in the cost of production, processing, and transport worldwide. And I will say that's one element that we need to monitor very closely it's becoming challenging for a lot of people through the value chain. Farm milk prices have increased almost everywhere except in Canada, reaching some record in some countries, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's actually ensuring the survival uh, of all uh, business uh, of farming in, 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 in all countries. For example, in Germany, I've seen lots of closure of dairy farm. Both all sales and retail market have seen their volumes increase in 21. This is especially true, especially due to the change of consumer pattern from consumer during the pandemic. Now that most of the country are advanced in vaccination number and have reopened their food establishment and services, uh, there's an expectation that it will return to a pre-pandemic consumer pattern. Uh, international dairy trade was not uh, affected significantly by the COVID pandemic uh, and the subsequent lockdowns. Uh, and the global conversation on climate change for the COP26 sustainable food system with the UN Food System Summit and healthy nutrition diets are impacting also the dairy sector and needs to be monitored closely. 
If you are interested to learn more about the situation of the dairy markets around the world, I encourage you to go on our website. You can access the World Dairy Situation Report 2021 that was released in October, where you can find introduction, information, general chapters, global. We also have a special text from the OECD uh, on the projection for the future, when we have then also chapter by country. Uh, and we have, uh, you have access to all the data uh, as well have slides uh, with different maps and figures so you can present uh, um, uh, about the dairy situation. So all of that available in the World uh, Dairy Situation Report. Let's talk about a couple of challenges. Um, chairman from the NDVB uh, made a very good overview of the situation in India and most of those challenges and opportunities are common uh, in different countries. So you might see some of them that will come back in my presentation. Uh, the first one, I, I, I always call it the social license to operate. Uh, and it's linked to safety and quality. That's expectation from government and consumer. Uh, environment, animal, animal health and welfare. Uh, those are elements uh, that actually the consumer and government are expecting the dairy sector to deliver. So they are key to our sector. Food policy. Uh, so we have policy in some countries on sugar, on fat, on salt. You've seen some front of back labeling, sugar tax, marketing ban, uh, review of government issue, derogatory guidelines. So all those elements are very important. I'm sure that Judith will go a bit more in detail on all those elements. But that is something that is a challenge for the sector and that we need to monitor closely. Uh, and I would say that's one of the key elements from IDF because we can benefit from the experience of other country, because not all of that is developed at the same timing. So we can benefit from colleagues in Latin America who have seen front of back coming much earlier than in other country. So that's a very benefit of idea of being able to share that expertise and, and, and get some learnings for the next country when they see those challenges happening, then they can, they can address it. Uh, obviously things that you're hearing more and more, and I know that's also a preoccupation in, in India, the perception that plant-based products are more sustainable. And I use the word perception because you would know by using that word that I disagree, <laughs> that, it is a, that it is equal. Um, I think that one important element uh, is that we need to remind everybody is that uh, dairy products are delivering a package on nutrition that is unique um, and it's, it's, it's the interaction of those nutrients are also unique uh, and what we have to offer in terms of balance of, of quality protein compared to the, the price uh, is definitely something that worth for family to take into consideration. Um, so we can't say that all products are the same, they are different um, and, and consumer needs to know what they're getting uh, and, and then they can make that decision. Uh, and the last bullet I've put in the importance of science-based facts in a world of social media. Um, those fake news, uh, easy access to opinion, opinion. And I would say in the last events we've seen internationally, and Judith will be a witness to that, we hear a lot of opinions. People have lots of opinions. Uh, and they think this, and they think that, and this one is better, and you should do that. But at the end of the day, policies, regulation, decision-making should be made based on science. Um, and that's something we need to repeat and repeat and repeat uh, because it is scary. When you hear people sharing their opinion and some people have very loud voice, uh, some people are, are not accountable to anybody. So they don't need anybody revision or support to make those statements. So it's easy for them to do so. But at the end of the day, we've got the, the life of people. It's their health, their wellness, their livelihood. Uh, and, and it's important that we ensure that decision by our governments and by a regulating body are based on science. Uh, I know that Dr. Srivasta will be addressing climate change a bit later. I just wanted to mention the importance of this new global initiative uh, that has been supported by key actor of the dairy sector and now supported by more than 80 dairy companies and organizations around the world. And it's called Pathways to Dairy Net Zero. Uh, it was officially launched uh, just the day before the uh, UN Food System Summit. And we had an event as well in COP26. Um, and this is, is, is very an important initiative. Uh, if you haven't uh, looked into it, I encourage you to go on the website 
you'll see the declaration, you can support, you can join in, there's all kind of action you can do. But the objective here is to, 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 to provide tools to the reality of different stakeholders and country to make an action. Because at the end of the day, this is an action call on climate. Uh, everybody are starting from different reality, different starting point. And this initiative is about bringing everybody on board uh, and finding solutions that are different for different countries. That's why it's called pathways, uh, because in the pathways you can find different elements. Uh, and one of these elements is, is reducing a mitigation of, of green gas emission. Uh, and obviously, um, as, as, as the Dr. Shaw mentioned earlier, uh, the importance of incre increasing productivity, efficiency uh, of, of, of the animal will actually have, uh, is one of the actions that can be taken to reduce climate change. Let's be more positive now and talk about opportunities. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities, and I, I, I felt that uh, that the chairman of NDBB did a very well overview of all those opportunities, uh, improve opportunities to improve, opportunities to grow, uh, uh, opportunities to engage. Uh, so all of those opportunities are very important. Uh, at the global level, uh, what we've noticed is still, uh, although we've been doing it for several years, it is still important more than ever that we continue to promote the role of dairy in, in healthy diets, produce in sustainable manner, and the contribution to the UN SDGs. Uh, the UN SDGs is the global metrics. That's what countries are using to talk about improvement. So we need to make sure that work we do in there is recognized uh, in, as an action by government uh, into the realization of those uh, sustainable development goals. Provide knowledge and expertise to IGO, such as CODEC and OIE and regulator. It is key, as I just mentioned earlier, as a challenge that science base is important then as an opportunity, we have, uh, we have this chance uh, of bringing up the science and making sure uh, that the, the governments and the regulators are aware of all the good work that is done through IRMA and others uh, in making sure that uh, they have all the information before they make a decision. The development of guidance and methodology to facilitate implementation of international standards and regulation and to support the actors of the dairy chain to provide safe, sustainable and nutritious dairy products. As I mentioned earlier, there is no food security if there's no food safety. Uh, and our role is to make sure that every, every actor of the value chain, whatever it, whatever it is at the farmer level, processing level, transport or retail level, uh, that all the best practices uh, are used and respected and understood by everybody. So every tools we can develop to facilitate that learning uh, is, 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 is actually part of the opportunities. Continue to support research, innovation, and promote science behind dairy. Again, I think that's key. Uh, our sector is very dynamic and, and, and following and, and developing and bringing those new innovation and product. Um, and if you follow the work of IDF, uh, we've done during the summer, uh, the summer a, web, a series of webinar on dairy, uh, digital dairy. Uh, was a f there was four webinars, they are accessible on a website very, very interesting in all different aspects of technology that could be used at the farm level, processing level, um, even in, at all level, even at the consumer level. Um, so this is part of the, the sector that we are in. So we stay, we stay on the top of the game. And my last one is to contribute to the idea of work because that's a clear opportunity and making sure that you, you work is also taking uh, into consideration your expertise is part of the global expertise uh, is, also, is also key. Now it is my uh, promotion time of the day. So I'd like to invite you all uh, on behalf of IDF community to attend the IDF World Dairy Summit in 2022. We'll be in Delhi on the September 12 to 15. Uh, and we look forward to have you uh, participate to this very, very global event. Uh, and uh, the, the team of the event will be uh, Dairy for Nutrition, Security and Livelihood. Uh, so very much in line with the discussion we just had about challenges and opportunity. Uh, and really, really hope that you can join us. Uh, as you can see, we've got the conference at the beginning from 12 to 15, then technical tour, social tour. That would be a great opportunity to connect and engage uh, with your colleagues from around the world. Uh, so I really encourage you to, uh, to, um, to join us at a time. You'll have the link of the website that will be available soon. And I'm sure that NDBV will share that with you. 
So that's it for me. I look forward to the, your questions and the discussion uh, that we'll have a little bit later. Uh, and I want to thank you for your time. Uh, and namaste. I look forward to be with you in person next time. Uh, and then I'll pass the floor to J Dr. Judith Bryan. Thank you very much, uh, Karin, for a very nice presentation. I have just one question. If you are staying back till the three presentations are over, we'd like to take questions for all the three, three speakers together. That's okay for you? That's perfect. Okay, okay. thank you. Then, then we'll start with the uh, presentation from Judith. Dr. Judith, please. Good afternoon, everybody, and namaste. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you today for this event, for this centenary event for Dr. Kurian. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Prajapati for inviting me to do so. Now, I have a technical issue here today. Um, technology is wonderful when it works, but sometimes it doesn't work for me. And today I have a technology issue, which means that I can't share my screen. So I'm going to have to ask the organizers to kindly uh, show my presentation for you and also push the slides on. So I will beg your indulgence for me having to do that. Hopefully it will all open okay. Yeah, it's opening. Fantastic. Uh, Ma'am, is it visible on your end? Yes, I can see it. If you could just put it onto the next slide, that would be brilliant. Uh, Thank is, you very much. Thank you. It's great. I can I can see it my end. So I yeah, thank you. So I'll just start. So apologies, everybody, again for the delay. I'd like to continue in some ways my presentation where Caroline left off. And I really want to start by talking about the fact that although I was asked to talk about the contribution of dairy to nutrition and health, it will be very easy for me just to talk about nutrition and health and not to put things into a world context. But the reality is we are judged on our contribution to nutrition and health by the world context in which we live. So I am also starting my presentation with a slide of uh, Dr. Ban Ki-moon, um, who is the former Secretary General of the United Nations. And the picture that you can see on the left-hand side is from October 13th, 2011. And on that day, the United Nations estimated that the world reached 7 billion people. And the projections towards 9 billion people go ahead for 2050. And on that day, Dr. Ban Ki-moon said something very profound which was that our world is a world full of terrible contradictions. We have plenty of food in the world, but a billion people go hungry. Some people have lavish lifestyles, but other people live in absolute poverty and we have to do better. So that's a real challenge for the world. Could I ask somebody to push on to the next slide, please? Thank you. One of the other challenges that we have is that the world demographics are changing. This UN publication shows us clearly from population statistics that the world is on a brink of a demographic milestone, as it calls it. Since the beginning of recorded history, there have always been more children in the world than older people, but that's changing we will soon have more older people in the world than children and more people of extreme old age than ever before. Next slide, please. Now, I think we have to recognize that getting older is a really good thing. We all want to be alive and we're all getting older for 
fantastic reasons for improved health care, for example. But old age comes with its own challenges to global health systems and global health systems that already are under severe pressure. So we have to find a way as we move forward to look after our elder people so that they're not just old, but they're healthy and old. And I think that's really important that we recognize that for those countries where there is extreme old age, we also want to keep people in extreme old age as healthy as they can be for as long as they can be so they're there for their families. And from the perspective of where the dairy sector may have its future customers, there are obviously very great opportunities for specialized foods for elderly people. Dairy foods as they are, are also great for elder people. And I'll talk about that later on. The new children coming into this world will not be coming into this world in places like Europe as we go forward when we talk about massive population growth. They will be coming into the world in the high fertility zones, which will be in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Southeast Asia. So we really need to ensure that we're looking after both our children and also our elders into the future. Next slide, please. So when we think about all of that, then we have to think about what the definition is of a healthy diet. And if you look at the World Health Organization, their definition is very stark. It's a diet that helps to protect people against malnutrition in all its forms, as well as non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and cancer. But there's nothing much in there that talks about keeping them healthy. It's just about disease avoidance, which is obviously critical too. But let's see why that definition is so stark. Next slide, please. Our healthcare systems, as I mentioned before, are under a huge burden. They're under huge burdens for a whole variety of reasons. The levels of non-communicable diseases in this world are going up. Malnutrition in all its forms are a problem. And when we talk about malnutrition, we very often talk about severely malnourished people. And we talk about people who don't have enough food in the sense that they're either stunted or wasted. We also talk about people who have micronutrient deficiencies. And on the other end of the scale, we talk about people who are malnourished because they're consuming an excessive amount of food. And therefore, they have conditions like diabetes, obesity, and leading on from that, heart disease and stroke risk increases. The large number of people who don't have enough food in the world really are having their lives taken away from them. As children, they may be stunted, they may be wasted, and that will impact not only on their physical health, but their ability to physically grow, to mentally grow, and be productive adults. And for those people who are obese or morbidly obese, Life is not so easy either because of the extreme medical conditions that they can develop. So we have to think why WHO has come up with that definition. It's trying to find a balance. And at the same time, we are not delivering on our sustainable development goals. We are nowhere close to zero hunger in the world. And there is a major focus now on ensuring that diets are sustainable not just from a health perspective, but also from an environmental perspective. And that's the correct thing to do for the future of the world. Next slide, please. If I go out into the street in the UK, uh, where, I'm, where I'm living, I'm an Irish person, so I could go out into the street there too. And I ask somebody what they think a healthy diet is. They will not give me the World Health Organization definition. They will say to me that for them, a healthy diet is something that's affordable. They want to be able to afford 
food for their families and they want that food to be safe and they want it to be nutritious and they want it to be culturally acceptable, whatever ethnic background they have. And for many people, they want it to, pre- to be produced in a way that is keeps the planet healthy for the next generations. For some people who are desperately poor, they just want food. They really want food. And for the rest of us, it's our responsibility to make sure that that food is produced in a way that's good for a healthy planet as well as healthy people. So they really just want to be well-nourished and healthy. And all of that fits with the sustainable development goals. And whatever life stage you're at, and you can see the stages here in the pictures, whether it's the first 1,000 days through pregnancy and toddlers, older children, teens, adults or elders, dairy does have something very positive to help you with in terms of nutrition and health. Next slide, please. So here's the context we're operating in, a world with huge challenges, but also huge opportunities where billions of people consume milk and dairy products every day. And not only are those products a vital source of nutrition, but they're a vital source of livelihoods. And that's not my words. That's not the dairy sector's words. That is actually the words of the Food and Agriculture Organization. Next slide, please. So let's take it back to basics. Why? Why is dairy important for all of those life stages? And if you are an expert in nutrition, please forgive me for taking it back to the very simple. But I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves of the very simple in order to be able to understand the complicated. So milk is a great source of high quality protein. And for those of you who aren't uh, really into the nutrition space, then high quality protein is a protein that contains all of the essential amino acids, roughly in proportions that the human body requires it. It's essential. It's an essential building block for muscle. And it's also tremendously important in terms of bone health. Milk is a great source of calcium. I think the world knows that. I think that's a message that's strongly out there in the world. And people always think about calcium in terms of bone health. They rarely think of the other functions that calcium has in the body. For example, the fact that it's involved in digestion and digestive enzymes. For many countries, dairy is the leading source of iodine which is so essential during pregnancy for the growth and and cognitive development of that child in utero. And as we go through life, iodine remains to be tremendously important in terms of cognitive function. And that's not all. So there are many other nutrients in dairy, some of whom we can talk about between each other as health professionals some of which we are allowed to put on food labels. Uh, And that depends on what country you're in because the amount of the nutrient in the food uh, impacts on on what you can put on your label. But we could talk about phosphorus, another bone-friendly nutrient, potassium, so important when it comes to heart function, riboflavin, well, that's very necessary for healthy skin and for release of energy for food uh, and many other functions as well. Vitamin B12, red blood cells, uh, tremendously important. Zinc for our immune system, vitamin A for vision, for reproduction, and vitamin D. In some countries, dairy foods are fortified with vitamin D, and that's obviously tremendously uh, important as well for a whole variety of things, including regulating calcium. And I haven't even mentioned all of the functions of those nutrients, but as I've gone through them, I hope you can see that whatever age you are, whether you're a toddler, whether you're an adolescent or whether you're an elder, these are all important in keeping your body healthy. And many people would not meet their nutrient needs without consuming dairy foods. And that's why they're included in dietary guidelines around the world including those in India. Next slide, please. Now, I want to talk to you about something that we hear very often, and we hear people saying, well, you don't need milk and dairy because you can get nutrients like calcium from plant alternatives. 
Now, plant alternatives offer a, a choice to the consumer, but they are not um, equivalent to dairy in terms of nutrition. So if I look at the studies that were carried out a number of years ago by Connie Weaver and Professor Heaney, they really looked at bioavailability from different food sources. And one thing that Connie Weaver showed quite elegantly in her um, scientific papers was the difference between having saying a food contains calcium versus the amount of food of calcium absorbed from that food within the body. So here I have an example for you, and it's a 250 ml glass of milk and a kilo of spinach. Now, both on paper, both milk and spinach have great quantities of calcium. But when it comes to the amount that can be absorbed, you have to eat all of that spinach to get the same amount of calcium that you can get from that glass of milk. And that's because the calcium in milk is highly absorbable, whereas plant foods contain plant acids, oxalates, uh, that bind to calcium, making it less available in the body. So plant foods are very good foods in themselves. Spinach is a great food. It has lots of fiber. It has lots of antioxidants. It's a great food. I'm not knocking spinach. What I am saying is we have to be very careful when we talk about or when we listen to people who have strong opinions, as Caroline mentioned earlier, saying that plant foods or plant-based alternatives are the same as dairy because they're nutritionally different. Each has its own merits and dairy foods can complement plant foods and the other way around. Next slide, please. I think it's also very important that we remember that dairy is not just calcium. It's not just protein. It's not just zinc. It is a composition. It is a matrix. And the matrix is very important in how the body reacts to the food physiologically. So there's been a lot of work done in recent years about the dairy matrix and its impact on health. And it would seem that dairy foods consumed as a whole food have a more positive impact on the body than giving people the single nutrients that you can find in dairy food. And again, if you're an expert in nutrition, I apologize for making it so simple for you. But many times when I give talks, people aren't experts in nutrition. So I try to put something in for everybody. Now, on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see this um, orchestra. I believe that this is the Norwegian Philharmonic Orchestra. And they were very dedicated and carried their instruments up the mountain in the snow to play a symphony. And the reason I have that is I like to think of the dairy matrix as an orchestra. Each of those players sound wonderful by themselves. But when you put them all together, that's when you get the great sound of music. You could consume individual nutrients, but that's not how people eat. People eat food. And when they consume dairy, they get the benefit of the dairy matrix for their health. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the fact that during COVID-19, many school feeding programs closed down. And there are already 149 million children in this world who are suffering from stunting and another approximately 47 million who are suffering from wasting. And they rely on school meals. They rely on school feeding and they rely on humanitarian assistance to help them and to help address some of the issues of severe malnutrition. But they're not the only ones who rely on school feeding. Lots of children around the world, irrespective of their income level, rely on school feeding as a part of their daily nutrition. And during the course of this year, um, the World Food Programme published this report and they talked about the fact that at the beginning of 2020, national school feeding programs delivered school meals to more children than at any other time in human history. And that makes school feeding the most extensive social safety net in the world. 
with one in every two school children receiving school meals every day in at least 161 countries around the world from all income levels. Now, the reason I mention that is that the dairy sector has been running school milk programs around the world for many, many years. And I hope that you will take the opportunity to go and look on the IDF website, to look at the special school meals bulletin, to look at the school meals knowledge hub, and to look at the review that was done on the nutritional impact of school meals around the world, which obviously contribute to these um, school feeding programs. And I hope that while you're there or even separately, next slide please, you will take the opportunity to, if you haven't seen it already, to look at the fantastic speech that Manesh did last year for IDF in celebration of World School Milk Day, where he gave a brilliant overview of India and the situation in India and the school milk programs here. And I really wanted to put this slide in because dairy is so important to children. We are such the backbone of their nutrition as they grow up. And it was really heartening to hear the great work that's been done in India on school, uh, on school milk programs and other programs. So next slide, please. I want to move to the other end of the scale now. I want to move away from talking about children and I want to talk about elders because we mentioned them at the beginning in terms of changing demographics. Dairy is critically important in terms of providing uh, nutrition for elders. As we, as we get older, we want to eat less. We lose our appetite. Many people who are older also have issues with dental health. They're more prone to fall. They're more prone to fractures. And so their nutrition has to be good in order to keep them healthy for as long as possible. And dairy certainly provides a very strong source of protein. It's also nutrient rich. So small amounts of dairy can provide high quality nutrition to the diet of elderly people. And we can also obviously talk about calcium in terms of bone health and, and fractures and, and elderly people. And the other thing is when people lose their appetites, it's very hard to get them to eat. And dairy foods are tasty. They taste good. And so it's easier to get them to have a food that tastes good than a food that they really don't want. So dairy is also has a benefit there. Now, I have on the slide here at the bottom just mentioned a study which is recently published. It's very, very interesting if you get the chance to, to read it. Um, it's a study where there was an intervention in elderly care homes in Australia, in Victoria, uh, the state of Victoria in Melbourne. And Dr. Sandra Uliano, um, who is a, a friend to IDF uh, and has been over the years, actually intervened with a group of elders, over 7,000 of them, many of whom were malnourished. And she did something very simple. She gave them some milk a slice of cheese and a little bit of yogurt every day. And at the end, even she was surprised by the great results that she got because she saw 33% less fractures in the group where there was a dairy intervention. Now that's a very simple intervention. That's not an expensive intervention. That's not an, event, an intervention that will put a burden on a healthcare system. That's a simple thing to do, and it made such a positive impact in the lifestyle, uh, the quality of life of those elderly people. I was also very happy when I looked on the uh, website for the Indian Dietetic Association to see that in their tips on healthy age and aging, they had mentioned reduction in appetite and the fact that it was important to give people milk and other protein food, high quality protein foods. If you could push on to the next slide, please. Um, very often in the dairy sector, people point the finger at us and say that we cause disease. And I think, you know, that's a, a very difficult one for the dairy sector. Because very often some of the people who do that, again, are people who have very strong opinions um, and not always backed up by the the bulk of the literature. So I just wanted to mention the fact that, you know, obviously the overall burden of disease 
we assess using the Disability um, Adjusted Life Year Score or DALI or DALI, if you'd like to pronounce it that year, which has been put in place by the World Health Organization. And it's a time based measure that combines years of life lost due to premature mortality and years of life lost to um, where you haven't been in full health, basically. And one DALI is equal to one. Year. So although this is very small and you may not be able to see it on the screen, um, you can have the slides afterwards. So hopefully you'll be able to see it then. I wanted to show you two things. I wanted to show you the slide on the left. And at the bottom, there is a list of things in which people are deficient, uh, which increases their loss of life or increases their DALI. And one of the things here is that people who are low consumers of dairy actually have increased DALIs. So that's not fantastic because it means a loss of health uh, for them. And on the right hand side, I wanted to also show you that um, eating dairy daily greater than two portions of full fat dairy is associated by 32, with 32% less cardiovascular events and 25% less mortality overall. Now, they're just two quick snapshots because I wanted to recognize the fact that while I'm telling you lots of positive things about dairy, there are lots of people in the world who say we cause disease, but when we look at the dalis, we see that we're actually beneficial to, um, to nutrition and health. Next slide, please. Caroline mentioned labeling earlier, and I wanted to put these slides in because if I'm being honest, I don't know at what stage um, you are in India in terms of people wanting to put dairy and other foods into a profile and label them as good or bad or put red or green or, or amber on them. But in many countries of the world, that's where we are. And if you don't have that at the moment, I hope you never have it because it's too simple a system. I wanted to give you two different views of the world, one as a nutritionist and one as a policymaker. If you're a nutritionist, you look at this. It's a nice breakfast. It's got some cereal, some fruit and some yogurt and some nuts. So it's got a, it's got great quality protein. It's got a good balance of fats between the dairy and the nuts. It's got calcium, vitamins, minerals, fiber. It's relatively affordable for many people. It's acceptable in many cultures and it's suitable whether you're young or whether you're old. Next slide, please. But with the nutrient profiling models that have been developed in many countries around the world, if this lovely breakfast was packaged up and put into a shop for sale, all of that would be forgotten. And the only thing that would be on the label is that it's classified as high in fat, salt, and sugar. In the UK, we have traffic light labeling. So if this was uh, available in the supermarket in one package, it would have a big red label on it. Um, next slide, please. And again, a small piece of cheese. Great source of calcium, phosphorus, vitamin A, riboflavin, B12, great quality protein. You can give it in age appropriate sizes this tiny little piece for this tiny little girl, maybe a slightly bigger piece for an adult. It's tasty. It can be incorporated into meals. A nutritionist would see this as a good thing. Next slide, please. Every nutrient profiling model that I have plugged the nutritional composition of cheese into classifies cheese as either amber, so be careful, or red, danger and it forgets all of the good qualities of the cheese and that's because if you're a policy maker what you're interested in is reducing population consumption of fat salt and sugar and therefore you're trying to come up with an easy measure to do that and in coming up with that easy measure or that easy representation you're losing um, the full view of the food so my caution to you is please <laughs> um, make sure, uh, next slide please, that you are reminding everybody, that we as a dairy sector are reminding everybody that since dairy was discovered, human beings have been consuming it. 
it's good for our health. Our consumers love it. And even in countries where consumers were moving away from dairy during COVID-19, they rediscovered how good dairy was because they went back to things that were reassuring and good for their health. A lot of people around the world would not have high quality diets or even adequate quality diets without um, the consumption of dairy foods. We're more than just a package of nutrients. We help economies. We help individual livelihoods. We look after land, all of those things that Caroline mentioned earlier. And we're essential as part of those programs that help deal with malnutrition. We're good at all life stages. We're not perfect. No food sector is perfect. All food sectors come for example, with an environmental cost. There's no food produced that does not have an environmental cost. But we do good in the world and we are committed to doing better. We are committed to being more environmentally friendly, to sustainable development. And we need to remind people about that because if we don't do it, nobody will do it for us. So I think I've gone over time. I'm sure I have. I apologize for that. I thank you all, and I thank um, the people who've pushed on the slides for me today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Judith, for very insightful presentation. This is the way we'll have to work with the dairy now and then really educate the society and that is why we kept this session title as linking dairy science to the society we need to educate them so uh, just like Karen, i also take your consent to have questions after the presentation of dr srivastava uh, thank you so much and then we'll start with the presentation from dr srivastava sir uh, you can share the screen from your side otherwise then we'll download here and do it Thank you very much. Thank you. I have already sent the PPT to your mail, but I am sharing from here. Yes, sir. I hope it's visible now. Yes, sir. It is visible and clearly audible also. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Prajapati. At the outset, I'm uh, very thankful to Dr. Prajapati and uh, Dr. Burgis Purian Center of Excellence for giving me this opportunity to be associated with Dr. Burgis Purian Centenary Programs. Thank you very much. My all uh, previous speakers, uh, Ms. Carolina, Dr. Judith, Professor Umakan Daesh, Director Irma, and, uh, and Sri Nessa, Chairman NDDB, dear participants, Dr. Prajapati, very good afternoon to all of you. I will take 30 minutes just to explain that what is the status of dairy sector contributing to the greenhouse gas and how we can go ahead so that our dairy sector is not contributing anything to the greenhouse gas emission or climate change. So topic has been given, the heading towards carbon neutral dairy. State where I've come to the topic, there are three most important major greenhouse gases which are responsible for the climate changes. These are the methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. This is the global picture that what was the status of methane and nitrous oxide in 1750, and now what is the status in 2019? Now you can see that it was 1137 ppb and now it has gone to 1800 similarly nitrous oxide if you see from 62 to 332 if we want to conclude that is in addition to the carbon dioxide in my all presentation what i talk methane gas or nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide it is equivalent to carbon green among the greenhouse gases the methane gas grew from 7.6 ppb per year in the last decade and with the faster growth was in the last six years, that is from the 2014 to 2019. Similarly, the nitrous oxides growth in the environment 
was very high in the last decade, that is from 2010 to 2020, 2019, and that was at the rate of 0.95 PBB. What I want to say that in the last six to 10 years, the level of either methane or nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide is increasing in the environment very sharply in totality. In the last 10 years, few terminology has been coined and one is the carbon neutral for which we are talking today, climate positive, climate negative, carbon negative, climate neutral, net zero carbon emission, net zero emission. We are concerned about the carbon neutral. Carbon neutral means if carbon dioxide or any other greenhouse gases, which is equivalent to converted into equivalent to the carbon dioxide released in the atmosphere from activity, but it is balanced by an equivalent amount being removed. So what I want to say in general terms that if dairy sector is releasing X amount of greenhouse gas in the environment through its practices, then it should remove also X amount of the greenhouse gas from the environment. It will be a carbon neutral dairy. Few facts about the global dairy, as has been talked by previous speaker. In the last three decades, world production of the milk has increased more than 59%. It was 530 million ton in 1970, and now it has reached to 906 million ton in 2020. So there has been 59 to 60% jump in the global milk production. With 22% of global production, India is the world largest milk producer, followed by USA, China, Pakistan, and Brazil. We are producing more milk, we are emitting more greenhouse gases, and that is the point of concern for today's discussion. Since 1970, most of the expansion in milk production took place in South Asia, mainly in India, followed by Pakistan, China, and Turkey. And these were the main drivers for the milk enhancement production. But Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Japan has also registered moderate production growth. Despite high production, in this country, if we see the countries which are having the surplus milk, these are the New Zealand, USA, Germany, France, Australia, and Ireland. I have two slides just to compare that how the world milk production grew. This was the cumulative growth annual rate from 1970 to 2020. It was 1.13%. This is the global milk production. But after 2000 to 2020, the global the cumulative growth rate was 2.26%. In India, it was a better situation as compared to the uh, global. In India, from 1972 to 2000, the cumulative growth rate was 4.4%. But from 2000 to 2020, the milk production cumulative growth rate was very high. That is the 4.76%. And this year, it was approximately 6.75%. This is the slide showing the glorious journey of the Indian dairy sector. Dairy sector, as has been said by Chairman NDDB, it is produced by masses. It is not mass production produced by the masses. And the best thing which I, I would like to emphasize that milch animal holding is more equitable than the land holding. Why it is like this? Because 85% of the total rural farmers are small and marginal, and they are owning only 47% of the farmland. But these small farmers are owning more than 75% of the mill chain. Well, I'm not talking about the total cattle livestock population, but mill chain. Well. So holding of mill chain well is more equitable for India. It is expected that by 2033, the dairy sector will produce half of the total agricultural output. It is a good scenario that in early 70s, India's milk production was only one third of US and one eighth of European countries. But today we are producing twice of US and 25% more than European Union. This is the government of India data. Milk in India is the largest agricultural commodity. If we talk in the terms of value, the value of only milk is more than the total value of all grains, including rice, wheat, etc., all pulses and sugar cane also. The value of only milk was more than 8 lakhs crore as compared to only 4.5 lakhs crore of all grains, pulses, and sugar cane.
Today in India, white revolution contributions surpass green revolution. Every fourth rupees is coming from the dairy sector in India. This was the glorious story of the dairy sector in India as well as in the global. Now come to that, what, what is the dynamics of the livestock population, dairy animal population in the last hundred years, centuries. So global dairy animals change over a century. This is the global scenario, buffalo, cattle, goat, sheep, and this is the total. Means in 1890, total population of buffalo, cattle, sheep, goat was 1,216 million, but now it has changed to 2,655. It has, it has come to 3,871 million. So 2,655 million more livestock, more cattle, buffalo, sheep, goat has been increased has been added in this population. In terms of percentage, there was increase of 218%. If we see the picture of India, the cattle population has increased 25% from 1951, because we don't have a data at present. So from 1951, 25% increase was in cattle, 153% increase was in buffalo, 215% increase in goat, and total if we see about 84%. So what I want to say that in the last century or in the last six, seven decades, especially in India, the cattle buffalo population has increased very significantly. So now question come that if we are adding, we have added 2,655 million dairy animals during the last century. So my question that addition of this population of dairy animals, does it mean anything beyond milk? We say that milk production has increased, but the increase in number of cattle population, buffalo population, does it mean something else beyond milk? My, question, my answer is yes. There, was comp there is competition of the land, water, we went for the deforestation, there was loss of the biodiversity, we are going for intensive input, more mechanization, if more mechanization, we are using more fossil fuel and there is a land change. Means increased number of dairy animals lead more greenhouse gases that will include methane, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. Now question is that how much greenhouse gas is being contributed by dairy sector and how we can reduce this greenhouse gas emission from the dairy sector. For dairy sector, carbon neutrality has become a buzzword. Despite very significant enhancement in production, greenhouse gas emission has also increased from this sector. And that is the reason that International Panel on Climate Change in 2019 has flagged the statement of FAO, which was given in 2013. And the statement was that agriculture, forestry, and livestock sector, in particular, generates nearly 15% of the global anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Anthropogenic means human related emission of the greenhouse gases. And dairy sector is contributing two thirds of this. As such, there is an urgent need to reduce the greenhouse gas from dairy sectors to tackle the climate crisis. Today friends, the sustainability of dairy farming in respect of greenhouse gas emission has become a very huge and important topic than what it was 10 years before. We have, we cannot ignore this topic in addition to the enhancement in milk production. Global dairy and greenhouse gas emission. Out of world's total emission of 50,000 million ton in a year, dairy industry gas house emission is 1,700 million ton, equivalent to the carbon dioxide. This makes dairy contribution close to that of aviation and shipping industries combined. FAO calculated that between these decades from 2005 to 2015, the dairy industry's greenhouse gas emission has increased 18% as demand of milk has increased. Demand of milk has increased, so greenhouse gas emission has also increased. From where this greenhouse gas has increased, so total was 18% enhancement, out of that, 9% came from the livestock share, that is the animal, animal share in CO2 emission. CO2 emission in, includes all equivalent to CO2, that is the green, that is the methane as well as nitrous oxide. 
37% from livestock share in methane emission and 65% share from the livestock uh, to nitrous oxide emission. This is the different sector, greenhouse gas emission, which is equivalent to carbon dioxide, which is equivalent to the car global. This is the global status. 24% of the total greenhouse gases is coming from agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. Dairy sector, livestock sector comes in this way. 6% from building, 14% from transportation, 21% from industry, 1% from energy, and electricity and other heat production process, it contributes 25% of the greenhouse gas emission. This is of global data. If we see the India picture, energy, because we are using more, more uh, fossil fuel, so our, uh, so our contribution from energy is 61%. Industrial process, 8%. Less is industrialization, so less contribution from industrial process. Agriculture is contributing 28%. And land use changes is contributing 1%. Out of this 28%, which is coming from agricultural sector in India, approximately about 50% is coming from livestock sector. As far as CO2 is concerned, India contributes 7% of global CO2 emission next to the China, which, are, which, uh, which is contributing 28%. More detail, what sectors of agriculture contribute to greenhouse gas emission in India? Rice is contributing 23%, rice cultivation. Manure management, poor manure management, poor manure management contributing 5%. Emission from soil, 12%. Enteric fermentation from livestock, from dairy animals, means the methane gas, nitrous oxide gas, carbon dioxide gas, greenhouse gases coming from the rumen through enteric fermentation is 59%. I'm sorry, this five should be here. It is from 59%. And 1% is from crop residue. If we see the total greenhouse gases, which is coming from man-made procedure, so livestock contribute about 18% of global man-made greenhouse gas emission. Now coming to the specific that what is the carbon footprint of per kg of milk production in different animals in India. This is our data. This I'm, so I'm trying to uh, explain that 1.21 kg of carbon dioxide are equivalent methane gas and nitrous oxide are produced if we are producing one kg of milk yield from crossbred. From indigenous, carbon footprint is 2.96. From buffalo, 1.85. And from goat, it is 2.54. Carbon footprint per kg milk energy and protein. Per kg of milk protein and per kg of milk energy. If we see, even in this parameter also, indigenous cow, either in terms of per kg of milk, energy are in terms of per kg of milk protein, indigenous cow is emitting more carbon dioxide or equivalent methane gas or nitrous oxides. Our crossbred is emitting less. This is the one story. I will come to another one. Carbon footprint of milk production, it be summarized in ruminants or in dairy animals, 8 to 12% of total dietary energy is lost in carbon emission. That is the greenhouse gas emission during enteric fermentation. Anaerobic fermentation of dung is another source of carbon emission. In India, livestock emit about 50% of greenhouse gases emission of total agricultural sector. We are losing energy worth 2.8 crores per day in form of greenhouse gases as a result of enteric fermentation in ruminants. And we have calculated that if we reduce the carbon emission even by 20%, energy worth of 56 lakhs can be saved per day. And this energy can be diverted for milk production. So we may enhance the milk production also, and we may reduce simultaneously the greenhouse gases. Simultaneously, the slaughterhouse are also playing very major role in greenhouse gas emission. Presently, we are having around 4,000 organized and 6,000 are un unorganized slaughterhouses. And they are leaving three to four million ton of offal per year. And they are the major contribution for greenhouse gases. 
some facts before us. Global demand of milk is expected to double by 2050. This means more intensive dairy farming. India also practicing more and more intensive dairy farming year by year. If there is a more intensive dairy farming, then more greenhouse gas. Developed and developing countries will produce an additional 9% and 33% of the milk output, respectively, by 2027. Greenhouse gas expended in India from 1.48 billion tons of carbon equivalent in 2000 to 2.84 billion ton in 2016. And it is projected that by 2020, it must have crossed to 3 billion tons. Growing by approximately 3% annually from 2020, carbon equivalent greenhouse gases emission is estimated to reach 3.7 billion by 2030. Methane is the largest contributor to total greenhouse gases from the dairy sector, accounting 50% of total emission. So whatever greenhouse gas is coming from the dairy sector, 50% is coming from in form of methane, nitrous oxide in form of 30, uh, that is 30 to 40%, and rest of emission is in the carbon dioxide. In some countries, really greenhouse gas emission from dairy sector is very high as compared to other sectors. This is the one part. But because of the greenhouse gas emission from dairy sector, there is climate change. But dairy sector is contributor as well as sufferer also for the climate change. There is also adverse effect of greenhouse gas, climate change, and thermal stress on livestock health and production. This is our work and NDRI. The estimated loss due to heat stress is about 2% of the total production. And it will be around more than 15 million ton by 2050. The maximum economic loss will be in Uttar Pradesh, followed by Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan, and West Bengal. We found that the decline in milk yield is less in mid, mid lactation period than the early and late lactation period. During climate change, there will be biodiversity loss also. What happened if there is a rise in temperature because of climate change, because of greenhouse gases? We studied that gamete quality will be poor. There will be change, there will be in there will be change in the quality of the gamete, either of male or of female. There will be more incidence of silent stress, silent stress. The duration of stress will be short. There will be decline in reproductive efficiency because there will be disynchronization of endocrine activity between pineal, pineal hypothalamo, hypothalamogonadial axis. We all know that pineal gland and hypothalamus gland, they are controlling the stress. We also found that because of the climate change, because of the greenhouse gases, there will be more incidence of mastitis, there will be more incidence of FMD, more incidence of tick bond diseases, filaria, babesia, trypanosomiasis, etc. So they are the contributor as well as they are the sufferer also. Coming to the last part, what can be done? Carbon neutral dairying is an option. This is the only option. Another question comes that carbon neutral dairying, is it achieved? achievable? Can we achieve it? My reply is yes. How we can achieve? By following practices that can reduce greenhouse gas emission. These are the following best practices which can be used to reduce the greenhouse gases and we can say that we are heading towards carbon neutrality. Whatever animal we are having, either our local animal, local breeds are crossbred, efficient management of dairy animals. We have to manage the herd health we have to provide the proper breeding so that production is increased. Selection of the animal will play the key role. We have to go for genomic selection. We have to select the animal which are consuming less feed fodder and producing more milk. So input use efficient animal is the need of the day. Either animal or breed, which will help in reducing the entric greenhouse gas production. As has been said by chairman and DDB, Ration balancing. We should balance our ration depending upon the nutrient available locally. Integrated dairy farming, which was being followed earlier, is now being seen that it is an option, which is a mixed with crop. So crop livestock integrated farming system. We have to go for best management of our dung, 
animal dung best management pasture has to be improved we have to grow the fiber low fiber plant or low fiber grasses enhancing use of solar thermal power for dairy dairy uh, dairy farming maybe for production maybe for milking maybe for collection maybe for chilling maybe for other processing so we have to reduce the fossil fuel, uh, fossil uh, oil and we have to go for thermal solar thermal power in the dairy sector few points which will lead us to carbon neutral dairy productivity enhancement how we can enhance the productivity friends a policy is required a policy need to be evolved to reduce the number of low producing animal in this country sooner or later we have to calculate the total carrying capacity of this land in terms of number of the animals in 1951 livestock population was half of the today's population but the area under fodder cultivation was the same today livestock population has just doubled but area under fodder cultivation has not increased so we have to calculate that how many animals we can sustain second aspect improve the productivity of low producing animal as i said that our indigenous animal are low producing they are future of this country we have to improve their productivity by genetic improvement by advanced reproductive technology maybe ibf maybe opu strategic feeding balance rationing will be one thing controlling the production diseases mastitis milk fever and other diseases so these are the of these are the procedures by which we can enhance the productivity of the animal coming to the selection of the appropriate dairy animals that is the priority which animal we should go for dairy now we have identified the genes which are responsible for food intake which are responsible for skin color responsible for production of more carbon dioxide gas or other equivalent greenhouse gases we have identified the genes so future is that we should go for genomic selection of livestock for higher production and lesser emission of greenhouse gases one example i am giving that our target will be to promote the climate smart dairy breeds tahiwal and thar parker is our indigenous breed cross bred animal that is the current fries current swiss our cross bred animal cross with um, houston friesian and swiss this is the blood flow dorsal blood flow in the dar dorsal side blood flow in the abdominal side blood flow in the ear this is the sahiwal thar parker and current fries data what i conclude that sahiwal thar parker have higher blood flow on dorsal part than current fries higher blood flow in sahiwal and thar parker that we call as jebu cattle facilitate better sweating rate making them more adaptive to climate change to hot environment friends on one side i said the carbon footprint was higher in sahiwal and thar parker but this data says that yes despite higher carbon footprint they are more adaptable they are more sustainable for the climate change continuing that solar exposure of jebu that is the sahiwal and crossbred revealed that jebu had higher cutaneous evaporative water loss than crossbred making them more climate resilient crossbred had respiratory evaporative cooling and increase the respiration rate so they are increasing the respiration rate if in respiration rate is increased so they become more susceptible to the climate change more energy they will be using for increased respiration as such ability of jebu cattle to increase evaporative cooling without increasing their respiratory frequency is an important index making them heat tolerant now you can see that this is the jebu we can see that a uniform temperature on whole body and this is the cross bred you can see that temperature is not uniform it is very high temperature on some part and some part it is very low so thar parker is more adapted to higher temperature than current fries thar parker maintain the same temperature all over body which is not the case of cross bred that's why indigenous animal are more adaptive now coming to the greenhouse gas emission equivalent to the carbon dioxide are equivalent to the carbon in different breeds of cattle and their dung there is more greenhouse gas production in cross bred animal current fees 
as compared to Jebu cattle, that is the Thar Parker and Sahiwal. Not only that, if we talk about the greenhouse gas emission from the dung, it is higher in crossbred, that is the 96.8 milligram per kg of dung than Jebu, that is the 48.3 milligram per kg of the dung. This was the first aspect that we have to go for careful selection of the animal, which are more adaptive, more resilient to the climate and emitting less carbon dioxide equivalent methane gases in the environment. The strategic feeding to reduce the greenhouse gases. There is more greenhouse gas emission in human. Why there is emission of greenhouse gas in human? Because human provide a moist, anaerobic and well-buffered environment and there is a constant influx of the substrate for change and conflict, constant influx of the products. The human microflora consists all microorganisms, bacteria, bacteriophages, protozoa, fungi, and methanogens, archaea, which are responsible for greenhouse gas emission. Increasing the viability of nutrients, so what we can do if there is a more methane gas emission, more carbon dioxide emission, more nitrous oxide emission from the human, then what we can do, we can increase the viability of nutrients using enrichment technology of the feed and fodder and using the human bypass technology. So we can use the uh, nutrient which passes the human and it is bioavailable to the animal for production of the milk. Improving the quality of fibrous crop residue, I will come later that how we can improve densified feed block technology, ration balancing. So these are the technology which we can use for reducing the greenhouse gas emission in rumen, which is a big house for greenhouse gas emission because all plus point, all favorable conditions are available in rumen. How we can reduce the greenhouse gases through manipulating the diet? We all know, friends, that 70% cost of the livestock production management system goes to the feed and fodder. And we have seen that high protein diet, if being provided, then the formation of green greenhouse gas is significantly reduced. While with high fiber content, there is a significant increase in greenhouse gas in, um, release. Replacing plant fiber with starch is good. Why? Because it decreases the ruminal pH. If ruminal pH is decreased, then the microbial population will be modified because this microbial population has poor tolerance in poor tolerance in acidic pH, more particularly protozoa and cellulitic bacteria. They cannot tolerate the low ruminal pH. If they will die, then ultimately hydrogen production will be reduced. If hydrogen production is reduced, then there will be less methane gas formation in the rumen. So this is the one way that replace the plant fiber with the starch. It will reduce the ruminal pH. There will be less survival of cellulitic bacteria and protozoa, and there will be less methane gas formation. Increase the dietary fat content in the feed and fodder of the animals. If dietary feed content is increased to 1%, then it can decrease the enteric methane, for methane gas emission to the tune of 4 to 5%. In the same way, medium chain fatty acid is having very good potential to reduce both the methanogens and methanogenesis. Means methanogens, which are responsible for producing the methane and methanogenesis, the process. Experiments have proved that if diet contain coconut oil, which is rich in medium chain fatty acid. And this medium chain fatty acid is lauric acid and meristic acid. If it is rich in this coconut oil, then greenhouse gas emission is drastically reduced by 88% in vitro and 73% in vivo. So what I conclude that medium chain fatty acid should be part and parcel of diet of dairy animals. Another point, polysaturated Fatty acid also decreases the methane production through its toxic effects on cellulitic bacteria and protozoa. Fatty acids from linseed have been found to reduce methane production in dairy cow without affecting animal performance. Another point, linseed iron, linseed cake, 
must be used in the diet of dairy animals. As has been said earlier also, probiotic-based microbial feed additives with Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Aspergillus oryzae, these two uh, probiotics we have identified that they have been found to reduce the methane production by 50%, which is directly related to reduction of protozoa growth by 45%. So if we are using this probiotics, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Aspergillus oryzae, then they will reduce the number of methane producing protozoa. Simultaneously, they will reduce the number of methane gas production. Two more slides, microbial feed additives and other strategy to reduce greenhouse gases significantly. As greenhouse gas production is associated with ciliated protozoa, we have confirmed that it is directly associated with the protozoa and more particularly which are ciliated. And they are contributing around 37%, 9 to 37% of the total greenhouse gases. So what option we can have that we can go for removing this ciliated protozoa that we call as the foundation. That is the elimination of protozoa from human may be another good strategy. So there will be no ciliated protozoa. There will be no greenhouse gas production. So we, we can say that yes, defoundation is one option for reducing the greenhouse gases from the dairy sector. Further, another option is by increasing the number of sulfate reducing bacteria in rumen through diet. Dinitrobacterium detoxification is one bacteria. Bolinella succinogens is another microorganism. So if we increase the number of these two sulfate reducing bacteria, the nitrobacterium detoxificans and bolinella succinogens in rumen, then availability of hydrogen will be reduced for the methane production. So that is another scientific option, which is the future. Among other strategies, administration of anthroquinone, ino4 antibiotics, such as monensine, organic acid, such as dicarboxylic acid, and among dicarboxylic acid, malic acid and fumaric acid has been found very effective. And in addition to dicarboxylic acid, malic acid, and fumaric acid, some plant extracts have also been found to be very effective in reducing the production of greenhouse gases. Last option, what we can say that few biotechnological approaches, such as development of vaccine, against selected methanogens, maybe ciliated protozoa, maybe microbes, use of bacteriophage and bacteriosins are newer approaches. So these are the newer scientific approaches for reducing the greenhouse gases from the dairy sector. In addition to manipulating the feed and fodder, selecting the good breeds, going for genomic selection, enhancing the production, productivity by using biotechnological tools, reproductive technology, the Another option is by manure management. Proper waste management to mitigate or to reduce the methane gas emission is most important. Livestock based, especially dung, is the major source of greenhouse gas. Not only emission of greenhouse gas, but also of pollution, pathogens, and odor. Farm waste are having rich source of energy and fertilizer elements which can be used for the agriculture. We have calculated um, that the animal waste, dairy waste, has so much nutrient that it can go for at least 20% of the total agricultural farming organic. Most mitigation practices involves shortening the storage duration of the dung, appropriate timing of application of the manure and use of an aerobic digesters. I'm talking about the manure management. We found that covering of ponds, tanks, and lagoons also reduces the emission of greenhouse gases. Integrated livestock production, as was our practices earlier, is now seen a good practice. If we are following this integrated livestock production, then it has advantage of water harvesting, in-situ resource management, 
there will be reduction in greenhouse gas emission, reduction in soil loss, sustaining soil microbes contingency during failure of funds, and then contingency to the farmers during failure of funds. Here, I would like to say that 50% of our soil microbes are not working at present. So livestock manure management as fertilizer is need of the day. Our soil microbiota is not functioning. There is nutrient deficiency either in terms of NPK or other nutrients. How we can conclude this? Dairy animals are both a victims as well as cause of carbon emission. Carbon emission means greenhouse gas emission in terms of carbon equivalent. It is important to identify the breeds with inherent genetic capability for emitting less carbon with good production. The process of feed production is main contributor and it is contributing almost half of the greenhouse gas emission from livestock sector. So technology for feed production has to be re looked revisit. Enteric fermentation is the largest greenhouse gas contributor in the animal production stage. So proper management of waste is also need of the day. If animal number continue to increase and feeding practices is not changed, global emissions because of dairy production will continue to increase. So very clear conclusion that if animal number continue to increase and we are not changing our feeding practices, then be sure that dairy will continue to contribute the greenhouse gases. An integrated approach of craft livestock agri food production system would improve the resources use efficiency. Uncontrolled and poorly regulated growth of intensive dairy production unit at peri-urban area need to be regulated. In Delhi, if you come in peri-urban area, you will find this problem. Carbon neutral and climate smart dairy is future. And if not taken care, dairy will negatively impact the environment, especially in arid and semi-arid region. And I tell you that our majority of the dairy animals, milk producing animal are in arid and semi-arid region. So the call of the day is that we have to adopt, we have to practice a dairy which should lead, which should head the carbon neutral dairy towards the carbon neutrality, climate smart, climate positive, means how much carbon, how much greenhouse gases is being released by the dairy sector, it should be removed also by one or other practices being followed in livestock sector or in dairy sector. Thank you very much for your patience sharing. Thank you very much, friends. Thank you. I will. Thank you very much, sir. Very insightful presentation. <clears throat> As usual, uh, I had a privilege to hear you repeatedly, and uh, I feel that you are one of the best orators and good presenter. So uh, there are no so many lessons from these presentations. Uh, I now uh, invite the chairman of the session, Simesh, to take question answers. Uh, we received the comments from uh, Judith uh, in the chat box that the GHG emission from dairy sector is reduced to 11% that uh, uh, we noted. And then Vinesh Pai uh, will take the questions from audience. I'm happy that uh, our panelists, Dr. Rekha Singh and uh, Dr. Bharti from Anna and Hyderabad are already joined. And I can see Dr. Peter Sterberg from Finland. Uh, welcome, all of you. So, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think thank you all these speakers. I think it was very, very insightful and uh, apt for the today's discussion. So may I now invite questions? I think uh, both online, offline. So, you can please indicate the uh, name of the speaker also to whom the question is uh, raised. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, my question is to any person. Introduce also. Yeah, I am, I am Gokul. I am from uh, Amul Dairy Anand. I am working in QA and R&D department. Uh, my question is, right now the milk per capita consumption has gone up to nearly 400 grams. 
we are talking about much of production productivity and right now in this season third season many private and even some of the organic sector they reduce the price if we are keeping on increase the production and as and until we have much export in the system and we don't look for a scope of export of dairy products i think future maybe after 20 30 years you may not be here that time will have a tough time what i feel it is my personal opinion okay i think i'll uh, i'll just briefly share uh, what i have thank you one sir okay so production is rising per capita availability is actually not uniform all across to travel to punjab and see you see it's 1.5 liter almost per person per day and when you go to north east it is still less than 100 ml so i think uh, we have lot of regional variation for the milk consumption in our country and because of some reason certain areas especially north east and some of the eastern states they are still not uh, you know got into the consumption habits of fresh milk and dairy products more of uh, them they rely on the uh, long shelf life product like powder and uh, sterilized milk so but i think things are improving uh, we will have to make efforts to first increase the production there change the consumer habits and let them get a uh, switch to the fresh milk and milk products that is one uh, one thing another thing uh, although we have a large milk production and we are largest milk producer in the world i think it is also important that we are also the largest consumer of the milk and milk products and if i know uh, you know the projections which are coming for the demand of milk and milk products i think they are more uh, rapidly increasing as compared to the production and because of the pandemic or whatever uh, you know reasons we have change in consumer habits maybe more uh, availability of more money in the hands of consumer i think the preference is always given to the milk and dairy products and the preference for milk protein i think uh, as compared to other sources of sources of protein and also as compared to carbohydrates you know as your income rises i think you will agree that you spend more money on uh, the protein source than the carbohydrates so all this combined i think i firmly believe that the scenario which you are projecting will not happen at least in the next 50 years till we are alive <laughs> but i i invite other speakers also uh, you know having given my view yeah dr judy to wanted to uh, say something no i didn't have a hand up <laughs> if you want me to say something i can one thing that i would just like to say on on the whole environmental piece is you know i'm living in a country where a law was passed 2 years ago to say that all emissions have to be net zero by 2050 and a law was passed in 2021 to say that by 2035 we have to cut our emissions by 78%. So I think as time goes forward we're going to see more and more not just aspiration around getting to net zero but law about getting to net zero and every sector will be required to to play its part so i think we have to keep that in mind as dairy we have a a, a tough job because we have to feed more people with less land and less inputs um but uh, but we we can do it we can do it thank you thank you thank you sir yeah yes sir i, I have a question to uh, caroline caroline good afternoon this is professor joshi from india i have a question you know you you cover two most important issues about the sdg first and second goals of sdg remains you know uh, uh, you know elevation of poverty and zero hunger hunger now if you see in indian context you know uh, the majority of the population you know the marginal farmers they are dependent on dairy 
and as you are aware on this 30th of november and first week of december we are having this wto ministry conference wto is the wto build you know the the food security to the people and wto the conference is free and fair trade now let me tell you you know as you are aware that 24% of the poor income is 1.9 yeah am available that you know in the indian capital of delhi we had a lot of farmers as it is called that and in india we have got 100 million farmers dependent on dairy only 10000 in australia and less than to food quality food security to benefit for our earlier years the development agenda could not take place it has absolutely failed you have seen you know in the bali ministerial you know that the providing this food you know that it absolutely did not you know to place And you know, I look forward to in this ministry, sir. You know that you know the food security to these poor people is kept. So the question was, you know, in our set, we are very keen for an FTA with European Union, and also after the Brexit, after Judy, also we are looking for an FTA also, and we are working. जुदीथारोलिनाड let him come here that's good uh, we, from that will be better if you come on the stage and speak then i think it will be better yeah okay so, so uh, is it clear now yeah it's now clear acha uh, carolyn could you listen to me what i said last time could you listen something or should i repeat yeah 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 actually no i i, I did understand that you your your context is talking about food security trade and how we mix how we combine we balance Local production and 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 trade. I will briefly tell you. You know, you uh, you raised two very very important issues. The first issue you raised was the SDG, and you know, dairy. Uh, you know, to deliver the SDG, and you know, I am talking on the SDG because after uh, you know seven eight days, you know, we are having the ministerial WTO ministerial in Geneva, yeah, which is happening. And if you see, last time we could not head it, but now uh, you know because of the COVID, so now it is after four years. You know, as you are aware that the Doha Development Agenda for last twenty years did not deliver anything. It In India, dairy is one of the most important parts for food security. India is home to 24 percent of the people who live in extreme poverty. India is home to more number of people who are in extreme poverty than 54 countries in Africa taken together. And as you are aware that you know the India, despite being the largest milk producer, 23 percent of the share in the world milk production. Our share in the world market is less than 0.4 percent. So you know, and you know, after the Brexit, uh, to Dr. Judy also, we are very keen to 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 to, to enter into an STA uh, with European Union as well as with Britain, uh, you know, independently both. Uh, as you are aware, that India could not sign the STA uh, with ourselves. And you know, I want dairy to be an integral part of this FTA. So, so you know, so two questions. One is on the food security issue, and you know, if the WTO cannot provide food security to, uh, you already told, you know, one billion people on the whole earth who are poor, undernourished, and hungry. So, I think you cannot leave this, uh, you, 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 you know, you, you know, hungry people across the world, you know, in the name of uh, fair and free trade, and trade cannot be fair. If the one billion people across the world are left to die, number one. The second question is: I wish, you know, the the the, uh, uh, and therefore I wish. Uh, I am very sure 
that you know countries like america canada and uh, you know a, a large number of countries you know they are not supporting india as a result you know the doha development agenda could not be concluded for last 20 years you are aware that in the bali ministerial india india got a peace clause to provide this you know the food security to our people and you know had we not done this food security to our people you know in india you could have seen much more number of death by hunger then the covid but i think you should compliment us the way we have managed you know the food security and the people in this country and here i would wish you know the the the, the, the two things health one is to provide food security you know and and allow india for uh, buying the food stuff uh, including the dairy product at the at the subsidized prices because of food security and dealing with the hunger and second thing is uh, uh, the peace clause you know so far we had a peace clause which uh, you know in 2013 and from peace you know we were it was only for four years we wanted a permanent solution for that and if we fail now you know in the first week of december then i think we are missing the bus and probably you know uh, take me granted i have written for the financial times and all other newspapers as well you know the credibility of the wto is going to stay at stake second my i think the question is that you know let's uh, dr judith find out the mutual way wherein dairy also becomes a part because you know dairy is an important part which is coming in our way yeah, yeah, you, you know in signing a free trade agreement both with uk and the european union and and you know we are very keen to sign uh, both with uk and european union because you know there are other products which we have identified you know textile is there automobile is there where europe can do so you know in case in dairying we we, we make some uh, you yeah, yeah, make adjustment so uh, and dairy becomes a part of this the country which is producing the largest milk on the earth 200 uh, you know billion metric tons of milk you know with our export share you know less than 0.38% so you know we also gain something in the market and our poor farmers also get their livelihood which is required thank you so much uh, so so uh, you know uh, uh, i would like to uh, you know have your inputs on this thank you so much thank you so much dr joshi Uh, and we had those discussion in the past so you know my personal view on the topic uh, but you also know that idf actually does not work on, on international trade uh, and on the free trade agreement so uh, on, on that topic i will refrain from any comment but i think it is important that, that you what you just mentioned about the importance of food security um, and i would go a little bit a step forward we talk also about nutrition security it's not just about providing food it's about providing nutritious food Uh, which is different as just mentioned earlier uh, the quality of the food is also important and the safety of the food is also important and we saw it during the pandemic um, and 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 globally i think we've seen a bit more of buying local uh, and we've seen that during the pandemic it is a reaction i think to a reality of wanting to develop and support a closer food supply while at the same time maintaining that safety net of international trade that can balance when needed and uh, to ensure that everybody can can and have access to food so i think on that sense there's a place for both uh, and india's policy is very specific and in the trade negotiation is very specific and i don't believe it's my place to to make a statement on that but one thing for sure and you're right the un sdgs are super clear and the objective is zero hunger a uh, couple with reduction of poverty and all of that cannot be achieved without agriculture cannot be achieved uh, without bringing access and affordability of food of quality and safety uh, and without having a strong dairy sector uh, in most of the country we saw it in in my slide earlier dairy is an important part of agriculture uh, and for those who believe that the world depend on meat and dairy made in laboratory i don't believe in that so they can they can think whatever they want but honestly i don't believe that the billion of dairy farmers in india will disappear on the contrary we got we need more we need more farmers that can uh, be prosper uh, and, and grow and develop and have better practices so they can develop and have their family uh, help their family get children go to school so for the livelihood for the nutrition aspect there is here to stay um and yes we can improve we can develop great new product and be adapt to new mm. reality but it is key to food security whenever the government decision are in turn of or they want to 
managed share system and are they want to position themselves uh, on the world uh, market, at the end of the day, there is a key part to ensure elevation of poverty uh, as well as empowering women, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and, and getting to zero hunger. Uh, and, and I do believe that India is on the right path to that success. And you've got the tools you need to do that development. Yes. Can I just add to that and say, I agree with everything you've said there, Caroline, and particularly when it comes to cellular agriculture or lab grown meat and, and, and dairy. I mean, most people could not afford what that costs. That really is uh, something that it's not doesn't have a proven medical record because it's a novel food. It doesn't have a proven environmental record because it's not transparent on its life cycle analysis. And it would be very difficult for anybody to legitimately say that cellular agriculture is better than conventional agriculture. So I think, you know, that the, as Caroline said, the, the farmers in, in India will, will still be farming. I don't think the world will switch to, to cellular um, agriculture. The food security aspect is tremendously important. And we have seen that in, in COVID that has maybe given us more of a demonstration and a wake up call than anything else. On trade and specifically a, a UK trade deal, um, I guess the only comment I can really make is that in May this year, there was an extended trade agreement between India and the UK, which as far as I can remember, largely covered fruits and uh, things like medical devices. But there was announced an intention to have a negotiation with India on a full UK India trade deal. But I can tell you that the government here, when it's negotiating trade deals, keeps its card very close to its chest until they have an agreement in principle. So I'm not sure what the discussion is uh, at the moment in terms of what will be in that deal. But I think they are also moving very fast with their trade deals, um, faster than we have seen trade deals move in the past. So uh, it, it may happen. Thank you, thank you, Judith. You are very right. The government keep it very close to the chest, but we are very close to the government, and we work hand in hand with the government. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, at, le at least your government talks to you. Dr. Joshi, Dr. Dr. Joshi, can I add close. two points? Please, Dr. Joshi. Go ahead. Go. Uh, thank you very much. You know, specific four or five points. Uh, yes, there is malnutrition in Indian children, but believe me, the situation is not as bad as bad as being painted everywhere. Number one. Absolutely, there is malnutrition, number one. Number two, we always say, and it is correct, that as far as food security, as far as quantity of the food is concerned, our craft sector can provide. But as far as nutrition security, quality of the food is concerned, it cannot be achieved without dairy sector, either in India or in any developing nation. So let us, let us write on the wall that dairy sector has to be the main segment for providing the nutritional security in this country. As far as trade is concerned, I am not expert in that way, Dr. Joshi, but since in India, the milk is produced by masses, 80% milk is coming from those farmers who are having one, two, three, four animals. Under compulsion, these milk produced by farmers are there for nutritional security also. Then I will be the first person to say that we should not sign free trade agreement at least for dairy products with New Zealand, with Australia. Because as I said, that surplus of milk, milk products are just on the seashore. So number number three, nutritional security. I compliment Dr. Uh, Judith to you. Uh, wonderful. Five points I will add, um, because you know, I delivered Dr. Korean Memorial Lecture in NDRI. So I worked several months, looked all the literatures, and I found most important nutritional attributes of the milk that milk is having a short chain fatty acid, butyric acid, which is not present in any other food. And this butyric acid helps in the multiplication of narrow cell, neuron. And that is the reason that if child is devoured with the milk during childhood, especially during initial 1000 day period, that is nine months in mother uterus and two month, two years after birth, the brain development will be poor in uh, children. And last point, um, uh, Dr. Judith, you, uh, you might be knowing, but I would like to emphasize to my participants that milk fat globules, 
membrane milk fat globule membrane is the best nutraceuticals for nerve development in the children it is composed of so many things when milk milk fat globules membrane is it is uh, it utilized for the formation of the phosphatidylcholine lecithin for, all are responsible for the nerve development so quality of the food for the growth for the development of cns of nervous system of git especially for the git development also i think milk should be an integral part of the food for initial 1000 days let us carry a message that the nutrition of a child during initial 1000 days which include 9 month in mother's uterus and 2 years after birth is most important nutrition for his or her whole life if child is not provided good nutrition during initial 1000 days the child will remain remain epigenetically predisposed with syndrome x disease which include diabetes hypertension and dyslipidemia and that is the reason that we are suffering now because when we were child science has not acknowledged this statement there were shortages but now there is surplus science has acknowledged so we should take this agenda especially to the rural mother folk mothers uneducated mothers that child must be provided good nutrition during initial 1000 days and in that milk is the most important food component it that, that should be our uh, underlined that without milk no good nutrition can be given to the child this is my message dr joshi trade you are experts you can give more comments on that prastav sir but i have a very little point and i am absolutely with caroline and judith i don't want indian uh, dairy sector to be protected and uh, this thing i want them to face the competition i want it to integrate with the international markets you know only if it has competition with the international market then only indian trade will improve, improve. otherwise indian cooperative sector has absolutely no incentive to go abroad They, they want to protect the complete, uh, you know, uh, everything in terms of quality. They will improve only if if there is a competition. But only thing is what I am, uh, you know, uh, what, what I talk at every international level in which we are doing a we have done a great homework this time for our WTO this time that you know taking into consideration the Indian situation some sort of you know uh, Judy told you it's very close to the chest but you know we can have an early harvest you know, for a few product and a few markets. But like Indian. Uh, if indian dairy sector remains protected it would never improve you have seen only free trade improve on the competition improve that and caroline is working very hard i know she will not speak on this because we have talked uh, you know uh, at multiple times on the, the issues which are controversial but at the same time india has to improve both in terms of the quality india has to improve in terms of the you, you know the environmental issues the climate issue which now absolutely we are committed to but at the same uh, thing we want the mutual recognition of our quality standards and you know product you know coming from eu to this this place and product to india from going to this place so we need to find a balance and i'm very sure that we are negotiating this uh, i wish that you know we get a help from you thank you so much caroline you have to say anything thank you i know i know she will not speak thank you caroline thank you okay julie thank you Yeah, yeah. I am Dr. Atanu Jana, professor at Dairy Science College, Aman. My question is uh, directed to Dr. Judith regarding dairy and nutrition. That uh, the nowadays we are having the high protein powders, preferentially made using membrane processing like ultra filtration, nano filtration, etc. and the previous ones for example the milk protein co precipitates or acid casein they are also high protein foods with around 90% protein what is the difference in the digestibility of this vis a vis the previous one conventional ones and the availability of the amino acid to the body upon digestion i mean i uh, i'm just checking i'm not on mute now i'm not on mute I think the the digestibility is good. I mean, we have high quality proteins when they are broken down into a powder. The digestibility remains good. I think powders are very very useful, particularly for people who are involved in sport, particularly for medicinal uses, uh, and for people who need additional help. They can also be particularly good in terms of malnutrition, and I think the studies have shown that that have come out of certainly Ozdek. 
or United States uh, Dairy Export Council, where they have done some studies looking at protein powders from dairy versus other um, forms of protein powder in terms of helping with malnutrition. Obviously, where those interventions are needed or desired, then milk protein is fantastic. But in terms of everyday nutrition, we would always like to get dairy products into people because you've got the complement of the rest of the nutrition. So I would like to start with, you know, what the DG IDF, Carolyn told us, milk is central and essential for integrating efforts to combat poverty and hunger. And this is so true. And the moment that poverty and hunger has been taken care of, then what happens? Then milk becomes poison. Then we shift from a daily routine kind of food to something like veganism and all that because hunger is not there. Then we have all the rights to talk anything about any kind of food we can have. You know, instead of going for any kind of science-based evidence, we start considering the opinions we start considering you know what the people are talking about as she has talked about the challenges that how to prove science on social media if you look at youtube alone and if you write milk is poison you might find hundreds of videos on this hundreds of we are blessed at least the people who are belonging to dairy industry we are blessed because we belong to an industry which, which, which belongs to the first food of life, that is milk. Now, coming back. Today we are going to look at what is the consumer's perspective of food. It is not about what we are telling them. You know, we do a lot of things right from, I think in the morning, um, Sir uh, Minesha was talking about all kind of sex sorting, feed management, and then we, were, we talked about the GHG part also in manufacturing, you know, we are manufacturing expert, you know, what kind of technologies goes into it, quality assurance while procuring milk and all that. But at the end of the day, is the consumer really aware about it or forget about it? Is he really interested in doing milk all this? Sorry, whatsoever being sold, whatsoever being offered, that becomes the most important thing. You know, this, this topic is very important because we are talking of two sides. One side which is so much science driven. And second side, who are least bothered about all these scientific kind of things, all the efforts being made by all of us put together. You know, the researchers, uh, uh, the people in procurement, the people in veterinary. Nobody is actually looking at it. A monkey took millions of a year to become a human being. Like the darling queen. This is what science says. But nobody looks at that a glass of milk takes from the few hours to become you. And nobody is trying to understand that what the body which we are talking about is simply accumulation of food which we are making. So where is the question? Where do you require that scientific evidence? But what we are looking at marketing, in marketing we are looking at all kind of options, all kind of, let's say, alternatives, plant-based products. And you know, even in our conventional products, we are finding so much, so many kind of substitution happening in the dairy alternative form. So in this panel discussion, the way we would like to go through it, we have an eminent panel consisting of people from Let's say manufacturing, the nutritional aspect, research and startup and entrepreneurial uh, development side, foreign trade, the technology. Now, looking at all these aspects, if suppose, uh, you know, if you look at the same issue from different angles, from, from the angle of these experts, probably we will be finding something interesting by the, by the end of this panel. So, what we plan. Uh, in the next 40 45 minutes, we would like to have two quick rounds right in the beginning and telling. The first one relates to that is in this changing environment, you, you know, where people are 
talking about veganism, people are talking about plant-based beverages, people are talking about going for food where they are challenging. You know, the very nature of milk itself. In one of the research in US, it was being seen. People, you know, two nutritional labels were being shown. One was of almond milk, another one was of uh, uh, white milk. And then people shifted to almond milk because comparatively it was showing less of sugar. And the sugar of milk, which is actually lactose, the consumer is not known to it. He is not going to white milk because more of sugar is seen over there. Now you see, this is the state of consumer. Is it, is it really worth pushing yourself so much for this consumer? Who is actually least bothered about all these things? So I think in the wake of all these points put together, let's try to learn from our uh, panelists on this. So maybe uh, we can start with uh, Dr. Parekh. Just in the first round, a quick two, three a minute kind of bite on how do you look at this changing, evolving consumer? And particularly, I would say I would like to add one more point over here. In post-pandemic time, I think in all of my life, I have not seen people discussing food so much. In all of my life, I have not seen people asking me question about the food or telling me about food. And you know the kind of things which are coming and I'll, I'll, I'll share some. Uh, good personal experience uh, very shortly. So, Dr. Pai, how do you look at this evolving consumer and how do you see that to this consumer, how to communicate about, let's say, the science behind the dairy? So, first of all, your quick comment on uh, how do you see this evolving consumer? Yeah. Yeah, basically, whatever we are hearing about the vegan foods or other analog foods, they are making more a marketing side of the things, you know, basically more bombardment, advertisements. So we have to actually really educate more consumers about the value of the milk and the nutritional value, functional requirements. Like you see, seeing the you know, idea of our GI has also very much explained about the nutritional aspects of the milk. So this is very much important. What were the PETA group also, you know, NGO, they are also trying to say this is a vegan food is better or plant-based foods are better than animal foods. Mm. But basically, if you see that our lifestyle, our, we are growing up in such a way that the animals are taken very much care of. So we call as a mother, you know, sort of a cows or amroth milk. So basically, we have to make the view of the nutritional aspects of the milk, which is a to the consumers. There are so many studies have been done. There is a lot of benefits are there. Milk is a separate, completely food, and which has got a lot of you know, advantages in terms of curing of some of the diseases like diabetes or you know lifestyle everything. So basically, we have to educate the consumer, make more uh, bombardment of advertisement promotion to see that uh, consumers don't get you know sort of a scare or go to the other food because they are not a complete food basically. They are all fabricated foods with the chemicals or some of the other additives. And they are very expensive. If you see the milk value-wise also, the nutrients are compared, the value of the milk is under value. Yeah. When you compare with the any other product, you know, you product or other things. So I think we have properly education, properly canvassing the nutrients about the nutritional aspects is very much important. Because a lot of other, other I mean, reports are coming, milk is sometimes called the black uh, or something like that. So we have to educate the people and the value really of the milk has got a lot of value doing since two three webinars we have done it to explain the value of the milk is very much important. But subject to the quality of the milk should be good. You see, yeah. basically healthy milk have a lot of nutritional benefits. Thank you. So I think it's a it's a very good direction uh, which you have given to us that uh, the nutrition is something you know which need to be communicated and as uh, Carolina was also mentioning about having some some platform in, in the idea side you know where communicating creating infographics and talking about the school milk program about all these kind of things and and I was also wondering you know Dr. Shivasuwa was mentioning that uh, while preparing for one of the Dr. Kurian's memorial lecture and when he was going in that then he found out that milk has got the short chain fatty acids that is butyric, which is very good for, uh, you know, uh, from the perspective of development of neurons and, and for this mental faculty uh, or development of the kid. Like, how important is this particular thing, you know? And, and, you know, the people belonging to the science side, that is the scientists themselves are taking so much of pain, going into depth and understanding it. 
बट हाउ टू कम्युनिकेट आई थिंक देर इज ए देर इज ए नीड टू कम्युनिकेट द राइट थिंग टू द कंज्यूमर राइट नाउ दिंग इज दैट वट एवर इज बी सब टू एम यू नो समबडी एज राइटली सेट दैट वट एवर कंट्रोल अवर माइंड कंट्रोल अवर लाइफ and if we look at on an average today's data of 3 hours consumption you know 3 hours full 3 hours kind of consumption of this uh, blue screen product which is there in our hand every day you can imagine who is controlling your mind and who is controlling your life so i think maybe we need to have some real good structure of communicating right to the consumer Yes, uh, Dr. Joshi, please. I would like to have your point of view. Thank you so much. I think you have covered. Hello, ma. Okay. Thank you so much. I think you have covered the point, which is extremely important. uh because uh, you know the entire concept of uh, plant based uh, you know the plant based drinks you know i will not call it milk under no circumstances it's milk so these are the plant based drinks and you know there is an uh, you know what i think i will not means my word which i talk that uh, idf as well uh, multiple times that you know it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, commercial complaint to maligne the milk and scientists have uh, you know no role to play here the whole world is coming from the promotional strategy the promotion is it's all the marketing role scientists can give you the proof that this is but the thing comes in communication now who will communicate you said that we have to communicate now individual cannot communicate uh, you know scientists cannot communicate institutes cannot communicate so what i wish is the dairy associations say indian dairy association the state dairy association needs the the, the the dairy boards which promote the milk like milk boards or national dairy development board they should you know uh, do a, a plain campaign you know the campaign that you are looking for the plant based food we should do and you know i, I have discussed uh, with the uh, uh, Now, Dr. Caroline as well. That you know, even the idea should do. And I ideally wish that all the dairy development board from across the world should put part of the fund to IDF at their disposal, so that we can have this campaign across the world. Now I'll give you. Uh, you know, so I have to increase. Now, the, if you see, if the 200 million metric ton of the fluid milk is consumed, the consumption of the soft drinks is almost two and a half times in the whole world. Uh, because the new generation is more convinced with that when you were talking of sugar you know um, uh, the, the scientists know more about the sugar but i'm sure the, the the people do not know i am not very sure whether you will be able to convince them that the soft drink contain 10.5% of sugar if you take one glass of soft drink you consume 6 to 8 teaspoons of sugar where in one you know glass of milk we take only 1 teaspoon of sugar so i think all these things have to be consumed and i am very sure there is a commercial political aspects of it that you know whether the mighty corporations like the soft drink corporations where there is a duopoly in the market milk there are multiple brands of the milk but in, in the soft drink market in the whole world there are two or three players across the world so those mighty corporation how will soft drink is one and then the second thing which is coming is so these could be a substitute this is a plain based drink so they say that, that you talked about you know almond and almost everything if you see the peta kind of organization there in you know across the europe and all developed world and now in india they have started putting you know lot of big posters and big you know the the holdings that if you take milk then i think you know you, you are harming yourself so only thing is let's not go here on the scientific methodology on which we have gone and last time in that turkey in the world uh, you know the dairy summit our you know the theme was also you know uh, on that communication was you know how the dairy food is better than the plant based milk so i wish and i wish that each one of those who are associated with the dairy industry should put up some funding you know and if you see who gains so the, what we call is a generic marketing like in america when the you know the the the, the consumption of milk was falling they had that you know drink milk campaign so take more milk have you taken milk they used various you know the the, the fill the stars to take milk so you know the, the got milk campaign was a, you know uh, which was i think advertisingly extremely bright campaign that they had so you know that kind of a campaign that you know got milk campaign you need to have a campaign where 
you know, international campaign under the leadership of IDF, ideally, that, you know, we need to do it across the world and there has to be some mechanism, you know, uh, uh, approved or agreed upon in the board of IDF so you know people pe contribute money because IDF can uh, you know, do this campaign across the world and with their this thing and at the same time by that time you know even if India as you are aware India or PCS is ki cow you know cow is our mother that we think and the animal we are associated but Southeast Asia you go to uh, you know Malaysia Indonesia Philippines so these people have never consumed milk if you say Southeast Asia China China has become our big milk producer, but lactose intolerance is very high. So these countries also need to be told that, you know, these are the uh, constituents of the milk which you get from nowhere else and especially for the vegetarian population. And, you know, I'm very worried that even in India, with so much of the vegetarian population, the, 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 the Sales of plant-based, uh, you know, drinks is growing much rapidly compared to milk, and we need to do something. So yeah. it's a very, very vital. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think uh, you raised a very valid point directly related to plant-based and I would like to mention that even a PPO glass full of milk uh, being originated from NDDB from this place only. And uh, on the other side, the, the, the campaign which you might have seen of uh, uh, Khana Meri Jan, Sunday or Monday, Khana Ande, so that was again by NECC. A very good communication and in that communication the contribution is from the producer. Like in Manthan Dairy Farmers contributed some amount, you know, collectively created 10 lakh rupees of corpus. On similar lines, with each liter of milk if one paisa is going somewhere and getting created, I think it could create much stronger, like I, I am fully with you, much stronger a communication which is more sustainable also because on daily basis, at least in organized sector, we are having close to 11 crore liters of milk per day. So suppose even for per liter of milk, I am not talking about the total milk production, even in the organized sector, with that particular milk, uh, with, with 1 paisa, 2 paisa, 10 paisa, I think some good corpus could be created. Then we have uh, Dr. A.K. Singh uh, from NDRI because you uh, wear two hats, sir, you you are into research, you are into entrepreneurship development, you are, and, and, and I'm slightly shifting, you know, the uh, little bit direction of the discussion in the sense that uh, over and above these plant-based products and all that, I think some over-commitments from the startups are coming in the name of A2 milk or farm fresh milk or something like that. So I would like to hear, you know, how do you look at uh, this as a challenge, both from the perspective of, does the consumer really understand it, whether it is plant-based, whether it is, uh, you know, A2, does the consumer really understand it? So what kind of challenges do you feel? Before I come with a bigger question to you, just, just your first take on this. How do you look at this evolving consumer? Okay, very good evening to all. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> what... Uh, I have, you know, keep on interacting with particularly the entrepreneurs and from the customer point of view, because being uh, one of the leading institutes, we keep on uh, uh, like questions from the general people also that uh, whether what is A2 milk, uh, whether it is good or uh, plant-based milk or alternative. So from that point of view, my, my always, you know, we have a take that all milk is milk. Okay. Uh, whether it is A1, A2, they, 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 these are some classification only, you know, so far from the scientific community point of view, we don't have any uh, like concrete uh, evidence which can suggest that which particular type of milk is better or which is not good. So milk for us, milk is milk, okay, and it is full of nutrients, it's one of the nature's perfect food and probably uh, in a country like India, where uh, milk and dairy products are mentioned right, right from the time of Rig Veda. And in fact, I keep on uh, asking people, you kindly refer those books, uh, even the Tarak Sahita and all that, where these dairy products are nicely mentioned uh, for their health-promoting virtues. So it is also a time for the scientific community to work uh, in tandem with uh, uh, pharma people. Uh, with, with the medical practitioners, nutritionists, physiologists, so that we can, uh, you know, uh, re in real terms, we can validate that what kind of, uh, you know, the claimed health benefits of different milk models. 
नेटवर्क इशू प्रोडक्ट एज सच और इंडिविजुअल कैसो वी कैन गेट प्रॉब्ली दिस इज द हेलो यस यस करण वाज देयर यस यस so this is the time where we have to work in collaboration and uh, so that and uh, so that you know we can put some concrete uh, uh, evidence to the consumers regarding that and i always say that uh, don't you know use these one because these are false uh, one and ultimately uh, milk is a, uh, is also associated with the purity uh, ethics so you know the if, uh, consumer loss uh, any faith on your quality or your whatever health claim you are mentioning and they are not perceiving it so ultimately uh, you will be the ultimate loser thank you thank you and i think uh, uh, you have raised a very important point related to collaboration definitely it's a collaborative work because no single institution in the world you know could uh, uh, get along with this particular message and reach out to all the consumers it's really very difficult now uh, i would uh, i would like to uh, now question dr bharti uh, dr bharti before you give your quick bite you know normally uh, we have heard you know since since ages we have been hearing uh, that you are what you eat actually so so what you eat you become and then there is a second theory which has come and that theory of course i would say again thanks to covid covid has given us uh, so large a university you know which was not otherwise available so we are what we eat was the theory and now the new theory which which come across is you are not what you eat you are what you digest and then between these two statements you know lies the whole picture of all kind of products coming in maybe dairy or let's say the plant based so for this evolving consumer just as a very quickly what you you have to say that from nutritional point of view uh, how do you rate let's say milk as a product as against these plant based beverages i am not talking of other categories as of now please so what i would like to tell you is that the evolving consumer is too much focused on prevention of non communicable diseases Uh, and especially in the post pandemic time there is also a lot of focus on boosting immunity whereas if we consider the milk and milk products they are important throughout our life course uh, like the earlier speaker said that during the first 1000 days of life it's important for the growth of the unborn child and during the first 2 years of life it is important for the growth of the baby and we have to understand that during the first two first thousand days are very important for the growth of the brain because 80% of the brain growth and development occurs in the first thousand days and uh, brain has a huge requirement for fats and uh, if we consider milk and other animal source foods which uh, have uh, which are good sources of fat uh, so it's important that uh, uh, with the fear of preventing non communicable diseases in later life uh, sometimes the children are deprived of good uh, nutrition through milk and other animal source foods uh, which provide uh, good quality protein very high quality protein which provide uh, good which are good sources of fat which are important for brain development uh, coming to the later part of like no childhood growth uh, uh, the growth of the muscles occur during this time and muscle growth is very very important for physical performance in later life it's important for income generation activities it's important for prevention of chronic diseases so milk plays a very important role and there are number of studies worldwide which have shown that the school feeding programs where milk was included resulted in growth in the height of children and also the muscle mass uh it's also important for pregnant women because pregnant women have high requirement of protein as well as micronutrients and studies have shown that pregnant women which consume larger amount larger quantities of milk uh tend to have babies with higher birth weight and birth weight of the baby is a very important determinant of uh childhood survival as well as health throughout the life course 
uh, again coming to uh, uh, adults or elderly population where maintaining the muscle mass is quite important uh, as well as maintaining the bone density for prevention of uh, age related fractures as well as muscle mass is important for preventing frailty and falls and reducing the risk of chronic diseases so i would say that milk has a very important role throughout the life course and we should not ignore its nutritional benefits for the fear of reducing chronic diseases which are in fact uh, multifactorial in uh, which are multifactorial determinants it depends as much on nutrition and diet as physical activity we have a lot of stress in our life which also contribute to non communicable diseases so i think we should not lose sight of that and as uh, mentioned earlier by one of the panelists it is actually a misnomer to call this plant uh, products as milks because it it tends to uh, confuse the consumer uh, that somehow these the nutritional aspects of these plant products are equivalent to milk whereas it's just the it's a fluid form of milk so, so it, it uh, uh, the protein uh, quality of the milk which has a number of benefits especially in children uh, plant uh, based products cannot equate it and i think uh, it should not be called milk in my thank you i think you gave good insights on uh, from the perspective of what you know plant based product could do or could not do and really if we look at uh, their ingredients then most of them ingredients will appear in the ingredients list also so if they are talking high of calcium you will find added some added source coming from you know both for protein sugar everything you know there are added, added source while in our milk there is a clean label simple label which says milk solids that's all so that completes the whole thing and i think uh, dr judith also mentioned that not only for kids not only for mid age not only for pregnant women but Uh, uh for aging population also which is going to be a very big uh, i would say a challenge in front of the world so milk is a big support okay and now i come to uh, uh mr kuldeep chaudhary and uh, so you are seeing it at the largest possible scale in india you are covering the largest part of country and let's say at global area also amul as a company we see there is there there are a uh, lot many things happening you have got your own plants also or maybe you are exporting also so now uh, coming back to this particular point you are doing so much for the dairy and suddenly you see people coming and uh, talking about a2 or talking about fresh farm or challenging the very integrity of the dairy products so what's your first take on this evolving consumer as such and Uh, lately we will talk about the technical side of it that how you are handling it through npd and all that but right now how do you look at this change in the, uh, uh, the consumers around the country on on this aspect okay uh, from a manufacturing point of view and the procurement point of view larger bill procurement side like amul and many other industries are there uh, cooperatives are there whatever milk we are buying it's continuously growing and the selling is also growing if you start comparing with if consumer is shifting to any other product say vegan foods or any other thing also it is like a marketing test when somebody does in a market but you have to see the repeat buying a consumer always is a confused person when he starts looking for a new product on the internet but the life cycle of that confusion ends when he buys the first time the product and the value for money is not there then he start comparing with say almond extract with soy extract then with milk then all the three nutrition value of all these three from 300 500 rupees a liter of almond extract we call it all fruit and vegetable sources only generates extract and juice can't generate milk so milk can only come from animal so a consumer starts looking on internet gets confused He stays confused till he takes the buying decision, and buying decision he takes when it comes for value for money. Money has to spend. He will spend first time for all these products, and then will feel the value of it. If it is not coming, he will only go for a historical uh, from the childhood days what he is in habit yeah. of it. Yeah. And hence, this industry is still growing. People will start doing experiments in the market. 
will start to give marketing uh, jugglers and all but we should not be feel afraid that consumers getting misleaded and he is not uh, aware of this nutrition values and all he is getting educated through internet he is getting educated asking questions to various person people coming to amul dairy ask that you are only producing milk how you feel how soya is different from this uh, uh, and how how almond is different i said you have tried this said, no we have not tried <laughs> we have just got confused on net uh, so 90% got confused at net and they have left it there hmm. so only 10% they try and people should try all the things in life yeah which is the new generation they try they will try of course the part of a diet can be 10% of this thing yeah and this whole consumption is growing so we should not worried about this 10% of if people are going from a to or analogs this will not change the consumption of whole india will not impact this whole industry at all will not impact the nutritional diet requirement of a person which is now very much aware yeah. since childhood days is aware of about this one yeah yeah so we can have a debate over this but consumer is confused for a very small time he is very smart these days which mr kurian and dr kurian have uh, acknowledged the power of consumer when he made this federation mm. that consumer can be called confused or challenged but he is always king yeah ultimately he takes the best decision mm. for his body and everything yeah yeah so we can have a discussion of all these things it's just new things coming up people gets involved into it gets deep into it they ask what is a2 and we say it's a different kind of a protein mm. extracted from the milk only mm. so uh, Or less uh, digestible protein, or more digestible protein. Uh-huh. A little bit, you can say, uh, buffalo milk has more that kind of protein which will be more digestible or more nutrition. But at what cost? Yeah, a little bit. And how you segregate? Who will ensure the A2 quality milk testing so that consumer is not aware? So it's very difficult, and and he is not even aware the level of uh, testing facilities which Amul has created, or let's say the dairy industry. Right. These play players have you know uh, created to prove the authenticity. And now I'm I'm shifting. So what what I'm doing now? Let's take the second round from this point onwards, and I'll start again from you because you could be um, you know more. Uh, uh, there there is a string which I am going to stretch from this point onwards. so you have given two important points one is the experimenting the number and number two the short time so it means it's not going to become a habit it's a fad let it be but this fad but this fad now let's look at this fad what this fad has done in us so i think a survey said that in 5 years time there was a 19% decline in white milk consumption in us the same survey also identified that there are 92 to 93% of the households were keeping white milk in their fridge on regular basis the same survey also found that 45 to 46% of those households were also keeping your so called plant based extract the industry size rose to a 13 billion dollars as against dairy 13 million dollars is hardly been it let's say i i i'll put it up like this In India, this business is standing today at 150 crore rupees. In India, it is expected to be by 2025 close to 600, 500, 600 crore rupees. But the thing which we are, we, which we are not actually seeing clearly, a particular survey being done by the regulator in India also saw that products like paneer, khoa, ghee, more than one quarter of them was having vegetable fat. it was chemically adulterated but if i look at those sectors the informal sector which is still let's say of the total milk produced 80% of the total milk sector if i look at that sector then plant based beverage more all the focus of the industries is hardly 150 crore but these three segments let's say khoa paneer ghee is having 200000 crores And which crosses that thirteen billion dollar? So why I brought these numbers so that we can you can we can feel you know the seriousness of how things are happening. Every other day we are finding news: corn found with vegetable oil, ghee found adulterated. The regulator has still they are taking some time. It will be done very shortly. I think two days back there was a case where a person launched hundred percent vegetable ghee. 
writing 100% ghee on that at 599 rupees and some actions have been initiated it means people have reached to that level where they are they have started to launch these products you know not really caring about the labeling and all that so my question to you is that amun showed the world that i think new product development and churning around four products six products 12 products in a month even that is possible amun showed to the world that when it comes to quality assurance if amun says it to then they can validate it because they have systems at all possible places if they say their ghee doesn't have any such kind of thing then for ghee also they have invested in millions and millions you know to create that system but it means both for regulatory and authenticity amul has done such a wonderful thing but the question is that how whole of this thing can be communicated to the consumer how the consumer does the consumer really know about it so what is what are those processes you know so the one side is that you have done the science inside your organization and what is happening outside your organization where you are telling the world that yes these these practices related to npd or let's say qa are actually happening at our end so maybe that is your second question where just let us understand how things happen right so from uh, amul point of view to ensure the quality majorly the product which we are making from farm to fork it's the main motto is uh, what you sow you reap so yeah. so you have to always focus on input to get the output so from the very beginning the mr korean days when they started it's the farmer mill and the testing ability which it started that time now over 75 over years how it has evolved and how now digitalization has happened from farm to fork which is helping us to maintain the quality and across the supply chain starting from farm if you say so good quality of nutrition given to the cattle will surely ensure a good quality of product out once it is out then you need a state of art equipments at the source at farm level which should not be uh, manually intervened by anybody so we had a system there in the farm where a milkman comes pour the milk and you get tested for eight adult times then it get tested for fatasinap then automatically from the wifi the data comes to the pc <laughs> even i can see every morning the farmer data so it's so transparent that farmer gets the immediately message also is fatasinap is this and this is the payment so this is the way the digitalization will take care of quality at each stage and this same digitalized process till the consumer you can show to your consumers from the digital platform from the visitors coming to your factory which amul always open up arms for them and this is the way to show how quality is managed seeing is believing seeing is believing yeah so it starts from farm then the milk is brought to the factory now milk is all pure there you have tested it well you have no manual intervention now you need tanker to be also false proof so we have now put a state of art Uh, sampling system on the crane tankers so automatic sampling happens for the society no intervention while well, milk going inside then the sealed tanker cip staged cip done from the factory moves to the societies nobody can open any of the port it gets comes back then only we can open then this whole factor cell is tested in the factory nobody has done any manual intervention and then the product start making for the product you have a digitally made machines now all the systems are there to check the product you make has sub studies you do put ccp standards now ccp has to be checked by operators only so how to ensure that ccp is done real time we can do it up to 2 hours 3 hours so we have put a digital system with barcode scanner and ccps so the operator has to scan at the same time he has to enter the ccp data inside so the digitalization process at each step is ensuring the full quality from farm to fork which is a must and which is the value of money which consumer is looking at at the last if you reach to the consumer side also you can have state of art factory state of art ccb systems checking then the transportation and distribution is also yes can make uh, wonders in your product so there also data loggers who are putting all our refrigerated vehicles so the transporters when delivers the product at the customer end the data loggers is checked if it is okay then only the payment is done so you have to keep track of your quality till the consumer mouth it has reached absolutely and that is the job of a 
of a manufacturing unit or a producers or a company like a mall has to ensure this full entity so so a manufacturer perspective now it makes very uh, you know it clearly shows the need of traceability why people are talking of traceability because in our food safety system also right now we are looking at let's say Eight hours time for hundred percent recall, and that is not possible from the retail, uh, the, you know, consumer perspective. So that's that's a wonderful thing, you know, by first digitizing the whole chain, and then at the end you have to simply link a consumer over there. I think which is easiest of the task amongst all. And you know how strange is this? Everyone, you know, when they talk about their quality, they talk about what do they do to check adulteration. But nobody actually talks about what do they do if adulterated milk comes to you, and that is where Amul became the first company owner to put a blue dye into it. The problem of adulteration is actually not only with checking it or having it or you know being reasonable for that adulteration, but how to handle that adulterated milk which is already an issue. And you have done such a wonderful thing. Again, say we will have. Go back, you know, to the consumer and somewhere that bringing this science to the consumer in her language, not in our language. Maybe CCP and not just CCP. The door should be shut right in front of your face. Dr. Uh, Bharti, I would uh, very quickly uh, be interested in knowing from you. You know how it happens that let's say it's almost uh, uh, more than three decades since I have been working in dairy, and. You know how it started in nineties. What used to happen? Suddenly, somebody was getting some buffalo milk, and then somebody they switch to skimmed milk or separate milk. I asked what happened in relations. So they said our doctor has told us, you know, to switch to this skimmed milk. By the end of nineties or let's say early two thousand, they switch to DTM, double tone milk, one point five percent fat, and then. Come 2014, those people were being switched to cow milk. Come 2019, they have been switched to desi cow milk or A2, whatever we call it as. As per the standard, if you look at the desi cow milk, its fat is close to five percent. And now, what is happening? You know, as this whole circle completes, the regulator is trying to reduce fat of buffalo milk from six percent to five percent. It means the gain. Started from Buffalo Milk in 1990, ended up in 2021 with the, with the with the suggestion of a doctor to reach to some desi milk again at five percent, which is equivalent to Buffalo Milk. I would like to understand from you that how as a nutritionist or how as a you know medical professional, because I always say that the relationship of a food person, food professional like us and doctors. This this is very very complimentary. In the sense, let's say if I'm a food regulator, I was uh, having a session with I am Indian Medical Association their doctors, and I simply told them as a physician, as a regulator, if suppose I'm acting on their behalf, my job is to deal with the culprit, and your job is to deal with the victims. It means at any point of time we need to have a very good collaboration in between us. So, from that perspective, how do you deal, uh, you know, with if if you look at the consumer who comes to you, uh, how this whole process of suggesting is it so subtle, or what change should be there in today's time when people are talking about vegan and all that and they don't know, you know, what will happen after ten, fifteen years? Please, would like to hear from you. Uh, thank you. I I agree that it's quite confusing because many a time science evolves. new research evidence comes up and then uh, there are certain things which we believed in the past we uh, find evidence contrary to it uh, so science is always changing but then this leaves people confused and clear communication of scientific evidence in a manner which uh, can be easily understandable and implementable is is a real challenge and it needs to be done there is no doubt about it and nowadays people have access to a lot of information through internet and many times the sources are not authentic so it becomes really mandate uh, it becomes essential for uh, an authentic source of information and the organizations such as indian medical association uh, have a very important role to play 
uh, I, I, I think uh, there is no sort of uh, shortcut or so, sort of easy way to go ahead, but uh, we have to keep trying for clear communication. And also many times what happens is uh, if you look at one attribute and try to sort of uh, choose a product because of that attribute, many times people ignore the other attributes. For example, like you know, products such as buttermilk or some products such as haldi dood. So people perceive that it's healthy, but then haldi dood has more sugar. Uh, whereas many of the buttermilks, uh, they are they have probiotic properties, but they have high salt. So uh, I think one needs to have a clear communication and nutrition literacy is quite important. And it falls on the shoulders of the nutrition and dietetics community, as well as the medical professionals, uh, to have clear, simple guidelines which people can uh, people can. Thank you, thank you. I think this term nutritional literacy means a lot, and I think again in whole uh, you know game of this communication to be created at a global level or at a national level, everyone you know all the important stakeholders are around. So maybe a bit of nutritional literacy, even you know, passing it on to the education system in the respective country in India. You know, FSSI is bringing this food part, the very very important, uh, uh, you know, of, uh, up to the eighth, seventh or eighth standard. You know, now the chapters have been created and and something is going on in that direction. Now, quickly, uh, Doctor Singh, I would like to know that in the wake of these new things coming up, now food safety is not an issue, authenticity is an issue. I am making claims, different kind of claims about my product. This is A2 milk, this is buffalo milk, this is cow milk, this is gear milk. So it's not that easy and it's not that cheap, you know, to get it tested and verify and make such kind of claims. So, uh, both consumer as well as let's say the person who is into this business is my uh, father, brother, brother or sister. Both of them require some very quick testing system on these authentic issues also, like checking authenticity. I'm not checking or asking for checking soda or checking urea. I'm asking for can I quickly check whether it is A2 or not, something like that. So in that direction, what NDRI is doing, you would like to know more from you. Um, <clears throat> NDRI has already developed the test kit, uh, which is uh, based on, uh, you know, like the DNA or uh, PCR based kind of test method, uh, which are, I will not say that they are very quick method, but they are reliable and uh, uh, they can check the mixing of different, you know, uh, uh, types of animal, whether they are uh, indigenous beasts or exotic ones, uh, even the cow, buffalo, or, uh, you know, the non, like the small remnants or so different types of, uh, you know, kits are there. But definitely at this point of time, these are not very fit ones. They take their own time. However, we are attempting to bring it to the farm the field level so that at the field level, they can be checked uh, within a minimum possible time. And, and what kind of kits are available from your side for consumers, let's say from milk perspective, some quick uh, test? Direct, directly, these are not available to the consumers, but uh, definitely we have transferred this technology to a few of the established uh, laboratories, uh, uh, NABL accredited laboratories, where uh, we recommend always, you know, and some in some cases, uh, like where we are doing some population kind of study, so uh, our institute, as well as Animal uh, National Bureau of Animal Genetic Resources, we, there is a group of scientists. This is also uh, test uh, uh, those, you know, admix kind of milk to see their purity, whether they are pure or not. Because because these kind of kits and these kind of testing system directly to consumer, they are also a way to communicate and tell them about you know safe food, about authentic food. Doctor Joshi. We have seen that internationally so many things are happening. I shared some data, but the other kind of data which is coming up nowadays, it's more on, let's say, synthetic biology is going on. In last two years, if I'm not wrong, I'll have to correct that figure, but I think it is close to $600 billion kind of investment going into Series 1, Series 2 kind of funding. And majority of those products are 
plant based products be it milk be it cheese be it butter and maybe lab based kind of products so, so many things are happening over there and you you, you see you know you have a very good hold on the complete supply chain from a global perspective you know the great things are happening and definitely india is the, one of the largest market and from social media consumption also i think uh, probably we are number 1 uh, right now in the world maybe if i am not wrong so from that perspective how do you see in in coming times these kind of developments are they going to have some impact i am not saying i am not really worried about that it is cool deep on this that uh, probably the volumes are not going to impact as much because our population is high and and the volumes are low and they are meant for some niche but how do you see this thing evolving and coming towards india in in near future maybe 3 to 5 years kind of thing do you see some threat for these products these technologies these companies i think it's a i think it's a very very pertinent question you know uh, mr chaudhary was saying that there is no threat but uh, i do feel i do feel that uh, you know the, the threat comes in two ways uh, number one these are all commercial proposition nobody thought 150 years from today that you know an a drink which was basically prepared by coke which was subsequently banned would become the top selling drink in the world coca cola was first invented with the coke and it was by a pharmacist and it was said it's a drink to make you fresh if you take coke you would become fresh now people knew only 30 50 years after that that cocaine is harmful for health so they cocaine was removed and then if you can market coca cola in india thanda matlab coca cola thanda matlab if you take coca cola it makes you cool coca cola has no property to make you cool because even caffeine in coca cola make your nervous anxiety level high if you can market that concept there is i have no doubt that plant based drink can market but these are all commercial proposition as on it i tell you second thing you i think you brought a very very good point that you know from 90 to 2000 and that i'll tell give you an international marketing perspective in 2003 you know uh, on the cover page of uh, you know the time magazine you know the, the cover story was you know if you take butter it will clog into your heart and you will have an heart attack so price of butter fell you know almost one thousand and in 2014 same time magazine there was a cover story that the butter is good for your health so number one and they are for you know a is the scientific research uh, i i am very uh, you know i do not know how to tell you hesitantly but you know like no economics is without politics and no science is without commercial proposition this tells me and this tells you the price of butter in the international market you know moving like price of gold and again it increased so this price impact can certainly happen in all you know the the animal based product not only milk but meat as well now you find even the fish is available vegetarian you, you know made with this you find the beef is available made uh, with the vegetarian yes. content and and they are giving a very tough competition to 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 animal based product so therefore you know i will not means my word dairy industry collectively need to fight it like we had in the egg, egg you know incidentally that time i was in apila and involved in this eh, sunday hoya monday root kha one day eh, if it is sunday or monday you should eat an egg every day so what happens says if the category sales improves so category is egg category the similarly is category is milk category sales improve you know you get more and those who have get a larger share like amul if they spend money on uh, on you know on um, <coughs> on including the category sale of the milk they get more benefit and therefore we need to arrive at a consensus to market this so number one and you know people culture now go who understand sociology incidentally it's a institute of sociology there are so many social scientists there culture is acculturation acculturation is a new culture comes if you talk to my grandparent you know they will refuse to take absolutely a soft drink but if you ask my children 
and their grandchildren they will refuse to take milk so over two year you know 20 year 40 year culture will change and i i do see a possibility in case milk industry and you can include the meat as well you don't uh, then the if you can convince the customer that the benefit that you derive with the animal based milk uh, which i think we call in the scientific category is the only milk and that is the drink tomorrow if they can convince the customer not today but 10 years 20 years down the line then i think there is a still have a tough time sir 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 so you you have created yes sir yes please sir i i think right now it's already going on there was a campaign from amul uh, frozen dessert versus ice cream yeah rose milk versus packed milk yeah right this kind of campaign running since long time i am still going on we fought with uh, shll also and we won the case so same kind of campaign is required uh, even so, even it is happening in plant based from amul there is yeah, no issue on that big versus plant yes. based but but, uh, but why company because each time no, when I, we talk of amul we are talking of 36 lakh farmers so i am not talking just i am giving example ha uh, we have to create some corpus for that absolutely we i am going to create a corpus and so when you or any any i am with you on this yeah. but get dr joshi when dr joshi has raised a very i, I think uh, how many of you have actually listened to him uh, between the words he talked about acculturation and i am talking about acculturation when i talk of acculturation means my own culture being taught to me acculturation somebody else culture taught to me to my generation it is more difficult to teach them our culture than to teach them other culture and that is where you know it's i think it's a new dimension which is now emerging in this that we need to do something differently maybe we need to have a differential approach in our communication also while dealing with a particular target group and different group of them that you want to say something yeah yeah can you hear me mike uh as is listening and then what joshi sir has just mentioned that sir, please uh, introduce yourself yeah i'm sandeep kedian from amul dehru yeah. in qnr and yeah okay so the concept is that uh, what is used is that like coca cola uh, you know the other games see uh, in terms of as people do have different emotions right milk is always put in a segment in advertisement also though amul has tried to change you know some funky some you know, some energy so we need to create milk uh, in fun segment how to advertise milk how to develop product you know the energy segment how to uh, what should i say like there is advertisement there are different concepts how you sell your product how you advertise your product you have your product in nutrition you have your indulgence you have in so we have yeah. flavored milk like yeah. flavored milk can give you all those yeah. you know the fun and energy whatever you say yeah like coca cola or any other thing but how do you advertise like that so those who drink coca cola it's not that they don't drink milk but they do drink coca cola because they need that maybe energy maybe that fun uh, in a day So this is how only for our cycle and different time, different mood. So yeah. the point is that we need to uh, advertise and make our uh, communication more into different segments. Yeah, absolutely. Nutrition point of view, fun, energy, all that stuff. So I think that will, you know, 19 percent of that milk, white milk drop, as per the US study, also indicates that 52 percent of that drop didn't go to plant based. It went to water. Simple drinking water, and then there were some juices, and then plant-based beverages were at the bottom. On one side, you know, statistics is the simplest way to, uh, you know, put different things in the world. So, one way of it, if your baseline is small, then even a very small growth will look very big. So, saying it, let's say, two hundred fifty percent of growth in plant-based beverages. Somebody said after his marriage that he was a poet. That my audience, there has been, there has been an hundred percent increase in my audience. So, how it was earlier? Only he was listening to his poems. Now he has got three iPhones. So, 
you know, this is all this, but, but these contexts, you know, we cannot be complacent. The purpose standing over here on this centenary celebration means 26 November onwards, we are looking at Korean too. We are going to enter into, and, and, and each time we have to think, we have to think like, had Dr. Korean be here, how he might have been thinking. What would have been his reaction? Amul has given a reaction. You are telling some newspaper writer something. Had Dr. Korean be here, how he would have reacted to Peta? I don't know. But I believe that all of us know. So the thing is, let's prepare ourselves for that. Very to Korean to. We have to lead the world in a different way. So we have to handle all these people in a in a different way. We cannot be complacent because I, I still remember I used to run some entrepreneurship development program. One person came to my program, booked himself for three days. First session was one, one and a half hour general introduction to dairy industry. I was just talking, you know, as usual. So I was talking and then there was a break. It was tea time. He said, I for the tea. He said, sir, I have a question. I said, yes. He said, Sir, I am only worried about one thing. Money is no problem. He was having some 250, 300 crore rupees kind of asset lying. Very near to Delhi and Mathra. Very big group. He said, Sir, money is no problem. Whichever line you say, we will put it up. My management has simply asked me one question. What if tomorrow the demand of milk is not there? Because whichever industry we have gone all across the world, this is a very simple question. Look at the demand. So I told him, what are you saying? Look, demand? Do you need challenge? Do you think can it be challenge? And today, I'm not saying it has been challenged. But what I'm trying to say that at least this is also not a state where we could be complacent and think that nothing will happen. Probably. So it's a, it's a good direction, you know. We are setting a right tone for this. Dr. Parikh, I think... Uh, one of the segments which is which is visible now now after post uh, pandemic that there has been a lot of conversion of unorganized into organized that uh, the consumer the dairy consumer is not ready to go for unhygienically bad and you know those and, and some typical categories unfortunately or fortunately are from the indigenous milk products. Paneer as a segment. 40,000 crore rupees segment, only 3,300 crores in organized sector. Sweets as a segment, 70,000 crore segment, maybe 3 to 5,000 crores in organized sector, maximum 8,000. <coughs> Same is true with, let's say, Khoa. Such a huge segment, almost 0% in organized sector. Now, when we talk about these products, and you are an expert, you have seen all sides of the dairy. So, from technology front, is our country ready? for bringing right technology and the kind of scale which is being required and taking out that subjective factor of this this Karigar's kind of vision on a product. Please, we'd like to hear from you on this. How <laughs> prepared are we? As you already mentioned, these products are still very much in a, on a, unorganized sectors. But we have to keep on trying to make that product become more uh, hygienic, long life, you know, proper branding, packing. So this is what is going to happen now slowly, slowly, because consumers want the quality product, long lasting branded products. They don't want to buy the loose products. So when you talk about the key also, now we find a lot of a variety of the ghee in different regions of the ghee. But now, some of the plants have started even making the continuous way of ghee, untouched ghee, or what we are using now, pre certification method, which can save their life and other paper packing also and branding also. Same thing, the paneer also now, most of the so many plants has come already in India, most of the similar to the cheese plant, which are imported one. So some of the plant has been modified to suit the any requirement with acid coagulation or continuous coagulation process. So these some of the things are happening, same thing the Rajgul also. The wall making machine has come, continuous fires has come. But this as you mentioned, the organic sector is a place which last day. 
so i look forward to see that our indigenous product has a good scope i don't know the sweets you are making now panda is also coming up in you know having a three two months live with the map technology so this some of the products which has been properly packed properly online production hygienic products with the less intensive maintain the product can be life can be increased so these are some of the things are happening But still, it has required a lot of great things there, particularly the seasonal, you know, like the Pali or another function. Yeah. Lot of scope is there for the fish. So, if there is a distillated product or fermented product, or it may be a coagulated product. So, we have got two thousands of the product. But as a whole dairy industry, dairy or all the organized sector has started now making use of some of the indigenous products and applying some of the technology, as I mentioned, to continuous cocoa plant is also now developing slowly. The condensing using the condensing Is in plant and finally the scrap type of heat exchange is there. We are also doing and we do also this as well as here also there. So some of the plants are also starting applying also in the dairy industry, but the growth is very slow. So that has to be accelerated, and but everybody is looking for consistent product, having a long life product. And uh, having a branded product, so this is to make sure that there is no allocation of what is happening with the key, with the core, other things. So this product will slowly, slowly will be will be used. So what I think. And, and these technologies sir, are available in uh, yeah most of the Italy also most of the also available and can be little bit collaborative from other countries also yeah. which can be utilized for making particularly these paneer plants are most of the locally also started manufacture now and imported are also available what we can buy in ten ten twenty times capacity plant so many plants has come from Europe also there is a lot of scope there also same thing for the Canada also. So these some of the things are going on very well now, but it's, it's just to estimate very fast. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I think uh, uh, I must thank all of you to be so patient. It's. Uh, I like to say. Yeah, please. On a lighter mode, uh, we have been talking about tall vegetable milk and other things. Yesterday we had a seminar. They're they're asking cooperatives and others to sell vegetables. Fruits and vegetables, no vegetables. Ah, fruits and vegetables. Huh. One day we are shopping vegetable milk, and better we sell vegetables and load the fridges to vegetables. So at least the customer will take huh. every vegetable, every vegetable milk now. Huh. So they will take milk. Yeah, absolutely. So that is one of the thing which we enter into that. Ultimately, a day consumer will, yeah, it will go into his or her mind. Yeah, yeah. But what is vegetable and what is yeah. milk? Yeah. Absolutely right, and I think uh, the context over here is if you have control over the consumer, the biggest challenge in front of farmer is not production, it's not breeding, it's not those things. The biggest challenge is market linkage. If there is a market linkage, if the cooperative has control over consumer, they can practically sell anything. Look at other companies that they are doing. Do you think milk basket has got legitimacy to sell what they are selling and at the volumes what they are selling? So super daily big basket. Country to like, do you feel that those people are likely to sell to sell all those products? So on those lines, and these are startups. Over a period of time, they will make it up. So now, let me uh, let me close this session just uh, with a line. I think uh, the last line uh, by Ms. Caroline was on that without food safety, we cannot expect food security. Food security is not possible without food safety. And I add one more line or one more word over here that without authenticity, even food safety is not possible. 
So I think the problem over here is not with the safety, but with the authenticity, with the labeling. So I think we'll have to look at a bigger, uh, you know, the span the ecosystem has to cover even the regulators, even, you know, like what I have been working in the area of even guiding people uh, on codex and all that to make science-based standards of the product. So somewhere this authenticity part must come because this is a very big challenge. On one side, you have a naturally nutritious and healthy food and suddenly a label tells no, it is coming in number or it is coming in red. So there are so many challenges. Probably we were not even able to touch the tip of the iceberg. But at the end, I would like to say that one of the initiations taken by one of the foundation will be a Food Future Foundation, which has been started recently, two years, I think it has occurred. And what those people have uh, conveyed and now it is going to happen, FSSI for the first time going to have school going children, college going students as part of their panels and committees. Because future food actually is being defined by them. Tomorrow, what do they want is actually being defined by them. You know, we can't have we can't have historical paradox and on those basis, you know, we are creating the future. The future has to be created by keeping present in our hand. No, so I think on this note, I would like to finish it. I once again thank Dr. Pujapati and, uh, and the whole panel, you know, who, who has been present uh, for such a long time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for such an engaging discussion. Uh, as we come to the end of this panel discussion, I request Dr. J.V. Pujapati, sir, Chairperson VKCA, a vote of thanks and concluding remarks. Thank you, Smriti. Uh, so it is a very long session, two to six, it's more than four hours now. And uh, I really thank all those who are online, who are seeing and covering and Dr. Srivastava and Judith still the end. Uh, this Dr. Sivasa called me, took my permission that I'm living now, and all those who are physically present over here. Uh, they traveled a long way and still they have to go back a long way. Uh, so I'm thankful to all of you. I will not uh, make any concluding remarks of you, but I feel sorry that Dr. Sodhi was to do that, but he was a very pressing meeting today and uh, he was required to leave it. So uh, we'll be soon circulating this uh, proceedings of this. And I will request all the speakers to give some brief about what the talk so that we can circulate to all of you, uh, to other online uh, viewers also, and uh, all the members. So I'm thankful to uh, all my panel members, especially starting from Srinivas Shah, Chavarandivi, to Dr. Arasodhi, even though he was today morning present and he left it. And then uh, the director of UMA, Dr. Professor Uma Kandas. Then we had. Uh, Carolyn, Judith, uh, Dr. Kasimasu, Dr. Joshi, Dr. Parekh, Sri Kuldeep, uh, there are two Kuldeeps here, <laughs> Kuldeep Chari and Kuldeep uh, Sharma, and all our distinguished members who attended this program and made it a success. So I'm happy that we uh, did what we want, we achieved what we plan to do. And probably there's a lot of sensitization has occurred now that how do we link uh, baby science to the society? And there will be good insights, and we have two eminent societies uh, connected to place. Kuldeep uh, Sharmaji or Dr. J. Parekh, I want that they should publish a full story about it, and the readers will take note of that. So, at the end, I thank all of you very much and thank my team who are working since last two, three months, especially Dr. Pankaj, Pankit, Dr. Smriti, and Russian. And uh, thanks to our role coordinator, Professor Mukhasat. Probably two more sessions are going on still parallel uh, down. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Singh, thank you very much for joining uh, and replacing the director of uh, NDRF for now. Thank you, President. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. We thank you all who have been patient with us uh, for joining us both physically and uh, virtually for the session. A special thanks to the active volunteers of UMA. 
we thank you all again have a good evening <laughs>